اتمنى ان الجميع بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأبياء والمرسلين أتمنى أن صوتي واضح للجميع <تصفيق> تمام تمام يعطيكم العافية I think we should start uh, بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Uh, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Muhammad Al Faisi. I'm a, a pediatric emergency consultant at King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center here in Riyadh. Also, I'm working as an associate uh, professor at Al Faisal University uh, College of Medicine. I'm also a director of emergency outreach program. Uh, I welcome you all to our. Uh, uh, pediatric emergency uh, conference. Uh, it is like an update. <clears throat> and uh, just to give you an idea of our course, it is like a, a two days course today and tomorrow. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I have the pleasure to introduce also with me Dr. Uh, Saleh Shihri, who is the chairman of the pediatric, uh, who is the chairman of emergency medicine, uh, associate professor of Faisal University, chairman of emergency medicine at uh, Prince uh, Sultan Medical uh, Military Center in Riyadh. Also, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Hamad Al Madi, who is uh, assistant professor of Faisal University. Uh, uh, pediatric Emergency Medicine, Department of Emergency Medicine at Prince Sultan Military Medical Center. <clears throat> also, to introduce our senior uh, expert uh, clinical instructor, uh, Mr. Uh, Hassan Al Habahba, uh, who is the clinical instructor in Department of Emergency Medicine at King Faisal Specialist Hospital. Uh, it's uh, good to stick to the time so we can uh, finish early instead of uh, staying till <coughs> late today. <clears throat> so, and uh, we will start today uh, with uh, an overview of emergency medicine in Saudi Arabia. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate. You can write your questions on uh, chat uh, area, okay? For any questions or any suggestion, or and we are uh, looking at that uh, chat area, or you can use also question and answer. But since most of you, I noticed they are, are using chat, so they can ask questions and uh, uh, give suggestion or whatever. Uh, I hope now the screen is very clear to everyone so we will start <clears throat> like any uh, emergency course would like actually to uh, give you an, uh, an overview of emergency medicine in saudi arabia when did it established and what is the history of it and uh, how proud we are of our uh, emergency program either for residence emergency or for pediatric emergency fellowship program um, <clears throat> I have nothing to declare. This is very important. As you can see, uh, I hope most of you are aware, this is King Faisal Hospital. About like more than 10, 12 years ago. This is around 2010. This is an overview. It can show you uh, the old ER, I don't know if this here, it, uh, if the pointer here can be used, okay? This is the ER emergency department and this is next to it is the protocol area. This is about uh, more than uh, 12 years ago. Uh, this is in King Faisal Hospital in Riyadh. This was the plan. 
the proposal that was planned and uh, it was uh, during uh, King Abdullah, rahimahullah, and uh, to establish a new uh, King Abdullah Center as well as a, a new also research center and new emergency building as well as protocol uh, building. This is King Abdullah Center, which was uh, opened in 2016. And uh, it is 22 floors. And uh, it, uh, it is actually open for uh, mainly for oncology and uh, transplant center. It's a state of uh, uh, an art uh, building and uh, it's one of the best actually center all over the world, to be honest with you. Um, <clears throat> if you can go to the left, you, the one with the green uh, color, uh, this one, uh, the outpatient clinics, it is uh, 10 floors. This is our uh, pediatric, uh, this is our uh, emergency building, which was opened in 2017 by the governor of Riyadh. And uh, uh, it is a five story building. And uh, we are utilizing the B1, basement one, and uh, level one, actually. And uh, because of staff shortage and because of uh, nursing staff shortage, we are utilizing only B1, okay? And I will show you some of this building later on. But before that, let us talk about also, we have uh, King Faisal Hospital, the branch in Jeddah, okay? And uh, there is a, a new uh, building uh, already started a couple of years ago. This was a Salam Hospital before, known as a Salam Hospital, and then it changed to be a King Faisal. And uh, there is a new structure and constructions uh, actually going on to have the uh, new uh, building, which is a huge, actually, city, medical city in Jeddah. This is uh, it, and it's uh, still not yet finished, okay? And this is another also, I think, another picture, yes. It can, you can see it is one of the best medical cities considered to be in the world. Okay, this is King Faisal in Jeddah. And hopefully within the next few years, it will be opened. Yes, this is also King Faisal Hospital in Medina, Al Munawwara. This is Al Miqat Hospital. Uh, there was a royal decree to make it, to change it to be a branch of King Faisal in Al Medina Al Munawwara. And this is out of Al Medina, uh, but about like a, mm, 15 to 20 minutes to uh, uh, the Holy uh, Mosque, uh, Prophet Muhammad Mosque. Uh, uh, it was open actually recently, just about like uh, two weeks ago. Okay, as you can see, and now uh, it is uh, seeing most of the cases to the reduce the load from uh, cases coming to Riyadh or coming to Jeddah. Now, most of the cases in the northern of Saudi Arabia, northern uh, west of Saudi Arabia, they are going to Al Medina Al Munawwara. Okay. Just to give you an idea about Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, it is a huge uh, country. It is a very big country considered to be the fifth largest country in Asia and considered to be the second largest area among the Arab countries with uh, like uh, about 2.24 million uh, square kilometers, okay? And as you can see, the Saudi Arabia, it has uh, like uh, 13 region, 13 regions. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, most of the population, they are concentrated in the uh, <clears throat> rural region, urban region, sorry. And uh, like uh, Riyadh, Mecca and Eastern areas more than 80%, unfortunately. So as you can see, as I mentioned, it is a land area. 
of 2.24 million uh, square kilometers with uh, <clears throat> and the population were in 2000 around 20 million and keep growing till uh, last year uh, the population around 35 million so there is a significant growth and this need more medical services to be provided to this huge number of uh, population <clears throat> Uh, we are expecting by 2025 to have around 40 million. As I mentioned before, most of the uh, our population, they were concentrated in the urban areas like uh, Riyadh, Mecca, Eastern and Medina region, more than 80%, while the rest, which 20%, uh, they are distributed among all the uh, uh, rest of the country. The, the, as a demographic indicator here, we have a very young age group, actually. That's why our pediatric population, we consider it up to 12, uh, sorry, up to 14, like 14 and above, this is considered to be an adult age group. Uh, I mean, when they are seeing in the emergency department. More than 40% in our, of our population, they are under age of 15. And over 65, only 2%. If you go to European countries or American, or America, you notice that this number of 2% is more, more than 10, 15%. Okay, that's why our, uh, the kingdom vision uh, 2030 to increase the life expectancy from 75 to 85. So we will see more percentage rather than from 2% up to maybe hopefully it reach five to 10%. As I mentioned, 85%, 80 to 85, they are living in urban areas. Okay. Yes, here, as you can see, oh, I'm sorry, I lost the, the... okay. As you can see here that the healthcare delivery in our kingdom, it is provided mostly by the Ministry of Health. Okay, and as you can see, that uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, 80 percent uh, it is free of charge, okay. While there is 20 percent private, uh, 60 percent of total amount of health delivery provided by Ministry of Health. This is like uh, you know maternity children hospital in every city, big uh, hospitals like uh, King Fahad Medical City. Uh, and other cities in different areas of the kingdom, uh, <clears throat> primary care centers as well. While 20%, it's already funded by other hospital, but still it can provide a free uh, services to their uh, employee and their dependent, like King Faisal Specialist Hospital, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of National Guard, Ministry of Interior, as well as Ministry of uh, Education. Okay, and there is uh, only private hospital, as we, you know, Al Habib Hospital, Dalla Hospital, Suleiman Faqih, and uh, also specialist hospital and <clears throat> other private sector. And as you know, the new vision 2030, they are planning to have uh, clusters of uh, health sectors distributed all over the kingdom and to provide and each club is responsible for their uh, population and by this they will reduce the load in ministry of health and it will be like a supervisory uh, uh, agent for 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 this uh, hospital <clears throat> as just a question if you allow me uh, i hope like most of you are aware that uh, this is, uh, just let me go to the next uh, page. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> uh, do you know what time, uh, let's say, uh, I can see your response in uh, uh, chat, please. Uh, do you know what time the Ministry of Health was established?
Can somebody just Ministry of Health? Okay, no, thank you. Okay, طيب. do you know what is the national day time? What is our national date? When uh, did uh, King Abdul Aziz uh, establish the kingdom and uh, uh, recognized as a, a kingdom of Saudi Arabia? Yes, you're right, 23 September. Okay, but which year? Which year? Yes, it is uh, 1932. So I think we should know this number or oh, this date. Okay, 1932 is the uh, establishment of Saudi Arabia as a kingdom. Okay, yes, you're right, Amani. So, uh, and uh, interestingly, uh, the health services were provided to the population before this date. And it was established initially in Mecca al-Mukarrama for pilgrims. Okay, and this was in 1925, just like seven years before establishing the kingdom, uh, the, the, the Saudi Arabia as a kingdom. Okay, because of, you know, uh, <clears throat> Hajj people. And at that time, it was difficult financially. It was provided by donation from different, different countries and uh, to, to, to serve the people coming for Hajj at that time. But uh, <clears throat> after establishing the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and after discovering the oil in Saudi Arabia, uh, Ministry of Health was established in 1951, just around 20 years after establishing Saudi Arabia. And uh, Red Crescent, which is the Saudi Red Crescent uh, Association, it was established like, you know, 10 years later, around uh, 1963 and since then we start to have like some you know improvement in health uh, services provided to our population before <clears throat> i will talk about the the emergency in details because i think this is our speciality and how we establish the emergency program for adult and pediatric but before that are we unique in saudi arabia like, is there anything in Saudi Arabia compared to other countries that, that we feel uh, that we are unique? Like something you feel proud or something you feel not proud? Can you please write in the chat so before we can, just to keep you uh, with me. Mm -hmm. Anyone can say anything? Yes, go ahead, Mohammed. Something you are proud that you are Saudi and you have it here in Saudi Arabia. Okay? Or something you are you feel, oh no, this is I'm not proud of. I feel like we should improve ourselves in this area and we shouldn't have such thing. Our religion, excellent, Mohammed Al Fahad. Yes, you are right. Our religion, we are proud to be Muslim, absolutely. And we are proud to have the two holy mosques, yes, in Mecca and in Al Medina, that all Muslims around the, the world, the globe, they are directing their, and excellent Zahra, you mentioned serving pilgrims. This is very important, absolutely. What else? Mm -hmm. Day after day improving. Ahsant, Abdul Azim. Yes, 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 yes. Weather, safety, proud, excellent. So there is so many things that, and we notice that for everyone that every day we, we are having a new development. Yani just to mention, uh, someone said, uh, <clears throat> Our emergency excellent, absolutely. And also we are proud. You know what happened with Corona pandemic? If you remember, okay, Corona, we are one of the first country who control and contain 
Corona COVID-19. Okay, and we are proud of this. And even some of our studies being reviewed and if you uh, see in the like uh, media, it's been reviewed in USA, one of the best countries in medicine, okay, and in Europe, okay. And we are proud that we are giving the vaccine to everyone, Saudi and non-Saudi, okay, for free. We should be proud of this, okay. We also we are proud to have the, as some one of you mentioned that we have a. a uh, the two holy mosques that uh, uh, our kingdom serving all the pilgrims coming every year by millions, okay? And uh, serving them, helping them, and giving them the best we can do, okay? And make their ibadah very uh, peaceful and very safe, okay? So let us um, go ahead and continue our slide. And you can continue giving me uh, your uh, also uh, things, but I need also negative things. Yani I don't want to have to have positive. Tamam? Okay. Yes, also vision 2030. Yes. And inshallah, it will be a gift. Yani, uh, put our kingdom one of the best. Now we are in G20. Tamam. Uh, a member of G20, hopefully later on will be one of the G7 also, okay? Uh, are we unique in Saudi Arabia? We'll go from the medical side of you. Yes, we have a high incidence of diabetes, okay? 25%, a huge number. Also, uh, one of our colleague, Dr. Bassam bin Abbas, who is a consultant endocrinologist, he said, also, I, hear, I attended his uh, lecture, and he said, there is also like more than 25%, 30%, they are prone to be diabetic. They are in a pre-diabetic. Yani, this is a huge number, so we have to be careful with this uh, disease, okay? Because it costs a lot of our life, and it costs a lot of our money. Uh, high incidence of ob obesity, most of the population, my goodness, up to 40%, they are obese. This is a huge number, okay? And you know what is the consequences of obesity? The problem, hypertension, uh, you know, uh, diseases and so many things. High incidence of cardiovascular disease, 38%. High incidence of vitamin D deficiency, 80%. And you know, vitamin D is very, very important, especially for ladies. Yani, uh, <clears throat> so vitamin D, we should test our blood for vitamin D uh, uh, for us and for our families and for our relatives and for our friends and encourage them to uh, do vitamin D. And this is a very simple uh, medication that available over the counter and you can take it. And you notice yani, a lot of my friends, some of patient or some of uh, people they were saying we feel like sick we feel tired we feel weird. and you discover that they have very low vitamin d high incidence of physical inactivity this is too bad like you know more than 70 percent of the population they don't practice you know uh, physical activity they don't go to gym they don't go but recently we noticed now People, they start walking in the street, they start walking in the walker, you know, and they start to be aware of this activity, how important it is. High incidence also of motor vehicle accident. We are considered to be one of the biggest countries that have a uh, motor vehicle accident, okay? A question. <clears throat> uh, we noticed that, what time did the ladies start driving? I think 2015, yes, in 2015. Okay, the uh, question, did the accident increase or decrease getting more when the ladies start uh, driving, our women? Yeah, I know it's uh, interesting. Hmm. Most of the, I'm sure most of the males will say yes, increasing. Huh? No. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Okay. Well, I think, yes, I have the answer. Yes, let's uh, go to evidence. Uh, uh, 
اوكي خلاص 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 والله الفيميل ذي جت ابسيت اي ثينك اوكي يو ار رايت اي ثينك وانس ذا ليديز ستارت درايفنج ذير واز انفورسمنت اوف ترافيك رولز اف يو نوتس ساهر ايفري وير انفورسنج اول ذا ميجرز اوكي اند بيز اون ذات ذا نمبر اوف اكسيدنت ريديوس دراماتيكلي يس ذير از سم uh interesting uh accident happened to uh ladies but still the number of accidents were significantly uh decreased of course there also uh, uh we are unique in saudi arabia that we are taking some measures actually you know by our young uh, age group uh, they are taking a high risk okay And I think if we utilize these people in some activities, uh, they may do a lot uh, things better to the uh, country. For the conference schedule, we will show you after the lecture. Don't worry. Okay. Accident, we said yes, it is more in our country, but compared to the last few years, it's getting less. Uh, this is in 2010. 15, uh, I got it from the media that was highest incidence of motor vehicle crashes, about uh, uh, 8,000 per year, my goodness, which is a huge number that can cause uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, lives, you know, uh, and a lot of money. <clears throat> okay uh, mid year of 2015 and since then there is a very interesting this is just a few months ago it was announced by the minister of interior uh, <clears throat> who mentioned that the percentage of accident were reduced dramatically more uh, you know uh, more than 34% and the number of uh, deaths decreased by more than 50% Okay, which was before a huge number actually. Okay, so this is a very good uh, achievement. Okay. Okay, as some of you mentioned that uh, we are proud to have the two holy mosques. Just imagine three millions or more than two millions in a small area, like five kilometers square every year you know, before, I mean, Corona, and the, with, with, with a minimal accident, minimal victims, minimal, okay? This is, I think we should be proud of it. <clears throat> طبعا, here, uh, some of you mentioned uh, about also Mausim al-Riyadh, okay? Now, you know, this is the development of uh, the, the new progress in, in Riyadh, you see, as you can see, and now we have every year Mausim al-Riyadh, and, uh, we be considered become uh, uh, one of the target of the countries that visitor, they can come and visit Riyadh and see the development in Riyadh and to see the most of the attractions, activities, okay, during this time uh, of the year, okay? Also, um, <clears throat> uh, there is uh, so many, uh, Formula One, yes, I agree with you in Jeddah now, This is one of the important activities worldwide, okay? And it's running now in Jeddah. This made the country one of the best countries, you know, uh, like uh, uh, attracting tourists uh, to us. This is also, as you can see, Athar uh, in Al-Ula, in Najran, in, in uh, so many places of the kingdom. We didn't know about these places a couple of years ago. And now people, they are going and visiting and seeing, okay. This is uh, also, I feel proud to show you. This. this is my area here, Faifa. You can see uh, clouds under the, you know, under the mountain. Okay, if, uh, it is, I uh, يعني, really invite every one of you to come and see it. It is a very nice place, okay. In Corona, COVID-19, we are proud. We have a strong achievement. We have, you know, that we are now one of the best countries who uh, really manage this COVID-19 very well in a short time. And hopefully with the, this new uh, <clears throat> genome, this uh, 
micron uh, hopefully uh, we can manage and we will not go into another lockdown again hopefully okay <clears throat> another thing okay uh, that we are also unique in Saudi Arabia that everyone is going to the emergency department for any problem this is it is an an, an, an an a drawback and it is bad to be honest with you more than 30 million ed visit per year this was done a couple of years ago and we noticed that most of the people going to the emergency department dr saleh shehri he will talk about emergency overcrowding solution and how to try to solve it and we noticed that <clears throat> and uh, but in saudi arabia that it's been noticed that everyone is going to the emergency department, regardless of the cause. You know, emergency, it is for emergency. It is not for anything, for simple cough, for flu-like symptom. You shouldn't go to the emergency, okay? You should go to your primary doctor, like a primary care center or whatever. In USA, uh, we have like, you know, uh, a visit out of 100, only 30 to 40 people going to the emergency. But in our country, out of 100, more than 90, 200, they are going to the emergency department. So there is a defect, okay, in the health system, why these people are going to the emergency department. And I think uh, Dr. Salih Shehri will talk about it in true detail, but I will, just, I think because we don't have a proper or a very good primary care center that referring patient to the emergency when they need, okay? You go to the primary care center, there is no urine dip to the, there is no x-ray, nothing, no infrastructure. And this made people go to the, make it a shortcut and go to the emergency department. And I think for this reason, <clears throat> now the Ministry of Health, they are putting their, way and they are putting their money in to, to, to have more primary care center will equipped with everything, okay? <clears throat> um, also, as you know, one of the problems that the emergency, we have a limited number of emergency physicians. This is like a couple of years ago, but with the programs, with everything now we are improving. Uh, this is in 2010, uh, the number of emergency consultants were around 1,500, and most of them, they are non-Saudi, okay? But the equation now is totally different. It's the opposite now. With the new programs, with all these programs distributed all over the country, now the Saudi emergency physician, they were more, okay? And as you know that we are graduating around 40 to 60 per year. So if we wanna reach the, the, the right number, which is more than 2000 or, okay. So we need to do like, you know, uh, and we are doing like the same number 40 to 60, we need around 20 years to reach the, the, the ideal number of physician covering emergency department. And for this reason, we had to uh, work hard and establish emergency program. As in 2000, emergency medicine approved, yes, uh, the program as a part of emergency program, but it was under surgery because the number of emergency physicians in Saudi, there were very, يعني, less than five, I remember at that time as an emergency physician, okay? So you cannot, establish emergency board, okay, with this number. So our program at that time was under surgery. You know, the main major specialty, which is surgery, pediatric, medicine, ob -gyne. So it was established under surgery. In 2004, uh, we work hard uh, actually to have the pediatric emergency fellowship program and it was submitted and approved uh, the program by the Saudi Council. In 2005, uh, the, 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 the emergency program was established as a Saudi board, okay? Emergency board, and it has independent specialty from the surgery, and it, it is not belong under surgery anymore this uh, in 2005. And in 2006, our first fellowship program in pediatric emergency medicine, and we are proud now 
to have <clears throat> also some subspeciality in in in, uh, in the emergency program like uh, you know diploma in Saudi uh, in emergency medicine and also the uh, society of emergency medicine which was established in 2008 mm -hmm. Uh, this is just the history, as I told you, the Ministry of Health was established in 1951, Saudi Red Crescent 63, Emergency Medicine 2001, Emergency Medicine Board was in 2005, and Pediatric Emergency Medicine was in 2005 as well. Right. Uh, the Saudi Board of Emergency Medicine, it was started as, as I mentioned in 2001 and was only four trainee during at that time. I remember them like the names and everything. And, uh, <clears throat> and now the number increased dramatically. As you can see, this is one of the first emergency board uh, meeting more than like uh, 15 years ago. As you remember, if the guy in the middle, uh, Dr. Al Frehi, who was the uh, head of the Saudi, the one to the left is Dr. Abdullah Al Hidayb, who established the emergency program. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now we are proud to say that we have a very good program. We have more than 22 centers. In Riyadh only, we have 10 centers in Western region, Eastern region, and different areas. Okay. And we have now a total of more but a total graduate till 21 this year, more than 500 physicians. And the current adult training program in, in, the, th in the four years, it is four years training, uh, around 300 uh, uh, resident. Okay, pediatric emergency program, for those who are interested to join the Pediatric Emergency Fellowship Program, it is either through pediatric, once they finish in pediatric, or we uh, 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 go to uh, uh, through emergency medicine, okay? This is a picture goes to many years ago, and uh, as you can see, I'm here in the middle, okay? With me, Dr. Uh, Al Umar, who is the one the right side, okay? Uh, on your right-hand side. Uh, we are uh, work together, and uh, actually, I did the fellowship program. We established the fellowship program in the kingdom. I feel proud to be with Dr. Al Umar. That Dr. Al Umar he did in King Faisal, and I did it at that time in the first uh, pediatric emergency center in the kingdom, which was a national guard. So uh, we establish uh, the emergency program, pediatric emergency program, which is now considered to be one of the best programs uh, in Al Hayya, Saudi. Okay, I don't want to waste your time with this picture. Uh, here, just to see how many graduates so far, fellows, uh, uh, graduated and now they are working as an emergency pediatric emergency physician and I'm proud also our speakers they are already graduated from the pediatric emergency our pediatric emergency fellowship program okay uh, current trainee we have now uh, in the program more than 60 okay and we are proud to have more than 10 center all over the kingdom so far and we are still progressing and opening center in different areas of the kingdom. Okay, this is here the governor of Riyadh uh, opened the emergency department, uh, which is a unique uh, department in uh, King Faisal Specialist Hospital. This is in 2017. Okay, just to give you some pictures of the, uh, this is just the last few uh, before I finish. Okay, this is the emergency. It is in B1. This is the gate. Okay, and this is this is level one. And consider this is the entrance to pediatric emergency. But because of shortage of staff, I think it's hold for this time. And okay, this is the station of the emergency uh, division. This is adult side. This is the recess area. And this is our station. As you can see, it has a, uh, provided with computer. We have a paperless uh, the system, a Cerner FirstNet. 
and this is also uh, rooms for education, for training, for everything. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> just uh, to give you uh, an idea about the emergency department. And this is just an overview of the emergency in Saudi Arabia. I hope you enjoy it. And if you have any questions, please, you can ask before we go to the next lecture, okay? Just for those who are asking any questions, okay? Just one minute for questions, if there is no, okay. Welcome everyone, okay? Um, this is just to, uh, also an announcement uh, for our upcoming international conference. And I encourage all of you, pediatrician and pediatric emergency and emergency physician to attend it because this is a very uh, good, uh, excellent conference. Uh, we uh, actually, uh, it's being provided by the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, with, uh, with our uh, national speakers, but 90% the American Academy of Pediatrics, they will present uh, this conference. And, uh, <clears throat> and I think uh, it will be very useful to uh, register for this uh, course. Uh, because uh, actually this, we used to go actually to state to attend these courses and it cost us a lot of money and effort traveling accommodation and everything. And we decided to have a deal with the American Academy of Pediatric to ask them to come and to give the course here in Riyadh. And it will be a great opportunity for all of you, pediatrician, family medicine, emergency physician, pediatric emergency, just to refresh all your knowledge because they will talk about most of the pediatric emergency pediatric topics from the emergency point of view uh, <clears throat> someone was asking how many we need to uh, by in 20 years how many physician i think still we need a lot and it depends on the population okay and there is no exact number but i remember this was given in 2010 there was an article uh, and presentation given by Dr. Tamimi Saleh. And uh, it was, I think, more than uh, 2,000. I'm not sure about the number. 2,500 physicians we need. And now we didn't reach this number. So still, we need more. Uh, thank you very much. And I think uh, now Dr. Saleh... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Shehri is the chairman of emergency medicine at Prince Sultan. Uh, uh, he will be uh, with you in a minute. Okay? If you have any questions, you can send it in question and answer or in chat here, please. Thank you very much. Emergency medicine hospital and he will be with you uh, soon. Uh, Dr. Saleh, you can start, please. Assalamu alaikum, Jamian. Yeah, very clear. Go ahead. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-musaleen Sayyidina wa Habibina Muhammad al-Alayhi afdal salati wa taslim We're going to start the next 30 or 40 minutes, inshallah Brief about the crowdness in emergency This is, everyone knows about the crowdness and the zahman that are present in the area long times And this may be the experience for everyone who works in emergency uh, maybe before uh, 10 or 20 years, uh, is 90 percent of uh, new graduate uh, physicians and interns from medical college, uh, they were refusing to work in emergency. Even they don't like to go down to the emergency or to take any case from the emergency. You don't like to work anymore in emergency. 
Uh, this uh, issues had been uh, significantly changed. A lot of changes happened in the last 15 years uh, because of uh, the new programs, uh, residency training programs in, in emergency adult and pediatric uh, had been initiated uh, since I think up to my knowledge is 2000, <clears throat> 2001. So the new graduate from the training uh, program and the residency, they, they were really looking for uh, how to change the area. And now, alhamdulillah, most of the tertiary hospitals they have will establish new structures, uh, good structure, effective uh, flow in the emergency. Still, there is a problems, uh, many problems, and we need to, to work on that. Uh, it's never ever been stopped. You know, the emergency, it's continuous change. Uh, so every two or three months, uh, if you handling the emergency, you need to keep to your, in your mind, there will be no fixed plan there. It's always been changed, never been stopped. So <clears throat> the problems now in emergency with overload, overload of the patient, that's because, um, you know, mo 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 most of the uh, uh, citizens that are working in uh, uh, holds living in Riyadh or in uh, other area, uh, they think once they having any illness, fevers, whatever, they should go to the emergency uh, department. They don't like to go to any more to the primary health care. Um, if you there's some questionnaire about it, they think about they can go there fast because near the emergency, so it's mean that's mean you'll be seen fast. They don't like to go to the primary care. So the issues in most of the patient, why they want to go to the to the emergency most of the time, because will be they will be seen fast, or they will be seen by subspecialty there or by the senior consultant there. <clears throat> so this is the caricature they mentioned here about the emergencies. My cold is the worst than yours, because it's happened to me. So those patients having flu, they believe that they are the worst, they having the worst disease in the world, more than the patient who having oncology or GI bleeding or whatever. That's the feeling inside everyone. An emergency, uh, in all the structures, unfortunately, it wasn't well designed because the place of emergency, they are at the center of the hospital. So it's difficult to be in access or in the hallways, uh, or there is no parking, or there is no gate for the high emergency uh, cases, uh, like level one, level two, or life threatening. Now, if you uh, look to the new emergency design, uh, especially for Riyadh, uh, good examples for uh, King Faisal, uh, Specialist Hospital, uh, Prince Sultan, uh, Medical Military City, uh, King Fahad uh, National Guard, they have all uh, having a good structure of emergency that's close to the way and there's parking and, uh, and the design to design it to serve the high risk patient first. <clears throat> the problems with the emergency here, that's when I talk as a patient, I have a problem before I'm arriving to the, to the emergency. You can see this overcrowd, especially this in Riyadh. I will take hours until we arrive to the emergency. Uh, this is no, you know, like a nightmare for everyone uh, when his uh, son or her son or <clears throat> mother or uh, father is getting sick or he's severely sick and he want to go to the emergency very fast. <clears throat> so don't be uh, <clears throat> uh, surprised when those patients arrive to the emergency they are anxious and look angry and upset because the experience <clears throat> from the, their trips from home and then they are arriving to the emergency. So they're expecting high quality, uh, good quality and welcoming faces. They will consider their issues uh, because he will maybe shout or panic or whatever. And they will expect that from other side, they will react with their concern. Uh, Emergency, <clears throat> this is the picture in every mind of every physician or in every maybe uh, uh, in other people or the patients when they arrive in the emergency, this is the problems they're going to face it in emergency. And we need to work hard to, uh, to serve patients, and maybe the high sick patient for that. And that's, we need to put the design and the flow for that. So uh, this is a simple story it happened in uh, England or in no uh, North Ireland. 
uh, because you know the the crowdness has happened everywhere uh, in the world, not only in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, especially in, uh, if you go to the to the, some Europe's country, they are very congested emergency there. In the United States, in Canada, also uh, Russia, also they have very very busy uh, emergency there. And we will see it from the next slides, inshallah. Here, this is a simple story. The crowdness happened in North Ireland and Belfast. Uh, it's happened. <clears throat> I think this is in 1985. This is what it said on Wednesday afternoon. The place was a light, a mash unit, like something out of Beirut. She said there were patients absolutely everywhere. We had patients in the outcomes area, patients lying in the middle of casualty, trolleys outside of toilet. Actually, the staff was shocked from this miserable area that we have seen. There was uh, nothing, uh, nowhere uh, for a relative to sit. She had, uh, Makafi major disasters in the area. It's just the populations here, they getting orders and converging to an emergency department. So this is one of the risks they do consider in their statistic, their, their age group is getting older. So the patients getting more sick and being, they, will need, they are needing to use emergency more and more. Uh, there was around 150 patients in small area, small emergency here, at one time, active patient, still uh, in the line, need to be seen by the physician there. So the, this is one of the pictures in the United States, one of the biggest centers in the emergency uh, in, uh, in Boston. This is uh, called emergency uh, crowdness, common phenomena in the most of the countries across the world. So we are not exceptional for that. Why uh, it's emergency, crowdy, patient waiting for hours uh, for being seen by a doctor. Uh, the patient will be waiting longer than usual, which is the maximum for uh, an emergency. You know, the rules uh, to wait for four hours, the 240 minutes uh, rules. So the patient, they will wait longer than usual there in the emergency. Uh, this will lead to the patient will be more anxious, more panic. Uh, they will maybe be more concerned and they will be maybe, maybe more aggressive for the staff. Uh, some patients when been coming inside the emergency and already decide by the emergency uh, physicians, they will stay for hours or even days or even sometimes a week before being transferred to inpatient hospital simply because inside the hospital is full with patient. Let's see some definition here. We can see too many patients here in the, in the, um, in the corridors here. Uh, a situation where patient in the ED requiring inpatient care are unable to gain access to appropriate hospital bed within a reasonable time frame. Uh, there is a situation where the demand for ED service exceeds the ability to provide care within a reasonable time. We always look to the time here and the resources. A situations in which identify need for emergency service out to strip available ED resources. So, or we'll go to the simple, uh, simple definition here, more patient than physical room space, or more patient, uh, more than ideal number of staff, more than number of physicians and nurses. We know, we know the crown is an emergency by feeling, or when we look into the air, it's congested, but let's go scientific. We'll see the signs of suggestive e, suggest ED overcrowd because it's that simple to, to say once you see many patients or many people inside the emergency, this overcrowd, you know. We need to go by, by some, some definitions or by, by signs there. Uh, when you start to treat sick patient in the hallway or in the corridors, because simply all uh, beds inside the room is full with sick patient, that's meaning you have uh, patient uh, level CTAS uh, or Canadian triage level three, two, or one. Hospital sending patient away, uh, especially level three, level two, because simply there is no rooms available and you want to keep uh, they want to keep the, the, the emergency for uh, high sick patient or life threatening or limb threatening inside the emergency. Patient is stuck in ED owing to lack to inpatient bed. So the patient, especially the old patient or 
infant, newborns, they are waiting for longer than usual in the emergency. They're waiting for days, and sometimes even weeks. And uh, who work in Riyadh, uh, you can, we can see this clearly. <clears throat> Patient care is not meeting the community quality standards. Uh, actually, they are, uh, even the patient, they feel they are, feel, uh, uh, they are being treated uh, as not in their good quality. Um, sometimes like signs when the IV uh, fluid finish and the machine start to alarm, nobody will take care about that. Uh, antibiotics, they will take a very long time until we arrive to pain management. They will take longer than usual for that. Uh, one of the bad things that uh, overcrowd has happened to the emergency, impaired quality of care, well, Jouda had considered looking to the patient clearly it's below the standard. Uh, can we make an online reservation two days before an accident? This is actually in, impossible here. Uh, the cost, the cost once once the AD crop, you know, the emergency usually is not so that uh, expensive. Uh, will not take money from the hospital or they need much, not much more uh, like funding like like burn unit, for example, or an ICU. They are the cost is not high. But once there is a crowd inside the emergency, the cost will be up to 10 or sometimes 20 times of the usual cost. And uh, the higher administration, they should uh, look to this uh, carefully. Uh, and what about staff? The staff, the burning staff, there's a big problem here with the staff. Uh, bear staff morals, staff burn out, and uh, this can be seen when the turnover of the staff happens quickly and bad in the emergency, like turnover in the, uh, in between the nurses, uh, a lot of resigning, uh, we need a lot of recruitment. Uh, sometimes if the nurses, they cannot stay more than three years or four years inside the emergency, this is uh, need to be uh, uh, significantly being solved soon for this. So here the more I think, because I'm, I'm alone here in emergency, either I'm staff or the director of emergency, because I'm alone here, the more I think, the more I've been confused I get, because I'm, a, I'm only the person I'm looking to, to, to the solution here. Nobody helped me. Uh, emergency is not only one person or one team to be solved. It should be the whole clinical structure inside the health institution be worked together for this. <coughs> the negative impact here, number one, is our customer, our patient. We can see their crowdness. They don't uh, receiving a good care on time. Uh, they will wait for longer than usual. The pain getting worse. If he's hyper hypertensive, they may be getting worse. Chest pain between this tens of people waiting for waiting in the waiting area, one of them may be having chest pain and they start to have uh, symptoms of MI. Uh, they need to be taken care for, or maybe every signs of a stroke. And uh, nobody will take care about it. And once we reach to that person, he's already gone or uh, uh, chest pain getting worse, and uh, maybe the different treatment is uh, out of uh, time for a time frame for this patient. The staff, uh, because the burning out of the staff will be bad impact on them. And uh, as I mentioned before, they will look for other specialty or they will change to the medicine, but for example, pediatric, uh, they will not stay in the area. Uh, organizations, so the Muassasa, reputations Hagaha, had to offer, the cost Hagaha Hazid. Uh, to be increased significant, they need more funding for the hospital to meet this overcrowdness. countries in the organization health centers between uh, communication between other hospitals, they will start to send patients from emergency to other hospital. Um load on emergency admitted patient. فهذه كلها حتخلي كل الـ كل الاريا بيرنج اوت موفينج ما تستوب. So crowding question here we have many questions about the crowdness questions. As who they decide uh, that crowdy means? What does mean crowding mean? When it is is it crowdy? متى تكون زحمه؟ نتوقع زحمه by scientific uh, methods or calculations. Why is it crowdy? Is it crowdy bad or good? 
for patient for ED. Uh, sometimes, by the way, it's good for uh, for more funding and more uh, paying attention to, to your area. Uh, should we do something about it? Uh, what should we do about it? So why why is it bad? Because patient will wait for a uh, long time here, there, more than four hours. Patients are not cared by the specialty groups. <coughs> Who should be caring for them? Nurses they will be busy with another critical patient. Patients don't get necessarily attention, and this is a big problem here, especially for all the peoples. And you can imagine that when you bring your father to the, to the emergency, and nobody pay attention for you for two or three hours. Errors, there is a lot of errors will happen because of the crowdness. Medication errors, inadequate analgesia, uh, higher mortality after admitted. Show uh, for calculation, Hadi. It's more than age 65 years uh, old uh, or the uh, infant, each hour increasing their adverse event by 3%. Or if they stay in the hallway or the corridor or inside the emergency more than five days admission, maybe they will have sudden death or mortality will be kept very high, six times, more than six times. Who decide what crowd mean? Is it me? or you in the emergency working, or the staff, or who else? No, it's for regulatory bodies. Is it hospital administrations? Is it the ED staff, physician and nurses? Is it the patient who left without being seen? more than, for example, 50 had the waiting. And you notice that you are only seeing 30 patients, and 20, they already left without being seen. This means there's a big problem here in the area. It need to be solved. What's the consequences of ED crowdness here? Let's take it by first for the patient. Uh, left without being seen, هذه مشكلة. وحزيدة المشكلة هذه بعد ما we start after 2030 because there will be new uh, rules in emergency. Uh, they will calculate this patient without being, being seen because he will go to another solution, uh, another institution. And your repetition وسمعتك راح تتأثر كثير في الموضوع ده. Prolonged stay of critical ill patients. Longer waiting time, uh, the pain relief, the car accident, the burn, the fracture, the trauma, there will be significantly delay in the relieving pain relieved. And we have, inshallah, a new project in BSMMC uh, to solve this issue, inshallah, soon. Delay in time, critical interventions, like patients who have PCI or uh, CAT or uh, need to be uh, rapid, uh, fast. Uh, uh, treatment for stroke patients, a septic patient, uh, head trauma, or whatever, the trauma, all the types. Patient experience will be bad. Satisfacting will be low for, uh, for our area. Risk of infections, especially we are in the corona now, and most of the times we are treating the patient in the hallway, or there's only uh, no uh, strong barrier, or there's no negative pressures inside the rooms because this is an emergency. So risk of infection spreading efficient very fast. Not only the corona, maybe the flu, influenza, even bacteria, even the MRSA also. The risk of infection between the patients, especially with the low immunity or immunocompromised, immunocompromised patient. The privacy, the privacy of the patient will be bad <clears throat> here in emergency. Uh, sometimes uh, there is a procedure that can happen to the patient and the door will be open. Uh, and this is issues of privacy, especially if she was female. Sometimes the conversations or the history, sometimes, sometimes there is a private uh, information. The patient or the relative, uh, they don't uh, speak it in the front of the, of the public. And unfortunately, the AR, there is, uh, with the crowdness, there is no privacy, unfortunately, for that. Well, I'm looking to the to the chat from time to time, but looks as and you know we we use a chat or questions for for this lecture because from time to time I'm looking to the chat. Ah, ma fi shi related to lectures. Ah, ni betabeha. You know we use a chat for the questioners during the lecture. Allah is al khairimi. Ah, consequences for the organizations, the hospital, and the community here. Also, increase ambulance diversions. Um, you need to call more ambulance. Uh, you need to call the Red Crescent to transport patients from the emergency to other institutions. 
long in the uh, stale or length of the stay, length of the stay will be increased significantly. So this will reflect a waiting area, طبعاً. Prolonged inpatient length of stay because more patient coming inside the emergency for to the inpatient. So expect all the world will be full. Increase inpatient mortality. Increase medical errors. What about the cost here? We mentioned it in, uh, before two or three lectures. That's uh, the cost uh, of uh, the cost of the emergency will be sharply up once it's getting cloudy. Maybe twenty, maybe twenty times of the usual. Uh, the AD staff. What about the bad consequences to the AD staff? Increased stress among the nurses, nurse recruitment, or retentions. It will be very difficult, especially now with the corona. اللي بيشتغل في المستشفيات بيلاحظ إنه في مشكلة كانت مع التمريض الآن حتى والدكاترة حجيب from outside the countries because uh, every country close for their own nurses because they need to work on that uh, for for the corona COVID and to work with the patient inside their country. Provide a stress and satisfaction between the staff. <coughs> Negative impact teaching. There will be no teaching. There will be short teaching for the for the resident, for the staff. Inside the emergency, because there is no time, research will be very low inside the emergency. Confrontation among the patient. يعني أنت لما تحول حالة مثلا specialty ويصير confrontation والbad conflict بينك وبين specialty قدام المريض هذه صراحة is not is not, is not supposed to be happened. Uh, frictions between disciplines and subspecialty. في 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 myths دائما بتصير على الكراودي حقة الemergency منها. The the primary care patient are the main cause of ED overcrowding. The primary care patients are the main cause of the ED overcrowding. Most of discussion in any meeting about ED overcrowding. So, primary health care, we say, why we don't want to deal with the primary health care? We don't want to deal with the high sick patients. They are the ones who take the most time. We need to work on it. In terms of level four or five. ممكن نشوف لهم اريا ثانيه او يتحول على البرايمري كير بس مش كل في اجتماع احط 70 80% من الدسكشن على البرايمري هيلث كير لا هم المفروض ما ياخذوا اكثر من الدسكشن حقه من 10 ل 20% من الميتنج اجندا واتس اوريدي بين ديسكسنج بيفور تو ميك ات فاست احنا هنا في البرنس سلطان ميديكال ميليتري سيتي وي هاف ا جود اورجنايز اند كونكشن بين الامرجنسي وبين البرايمري هيلث كير في الوزارات وفي الياسمين وفي اذر اريا لانه ما شاء الله عندنا تقريبا حوالي 7 برايمري او 8 برايمري هيلث كير اراوند الرياض فاتس ايزي تو لو سيك بيشنت لما بنحولهم للبرايمري هيلث كير فاحنا نزلنا اللود تقريبا حوالي 45% تقريبا هنا في الامرجنسي بس انه بقي 45% هذول هم اللي بيشكلوا او بقوا 55% هذول اللي بيشكلوا تقريبا ازدحام الطوارئ عندنا في العسكري الان جيت مور دكتورز اند نيرسز تو مانج ذا اديشنال بيشنت ويتنج فور بيدز واحيانا تجيب فيزيشنز بس ذير از نو مور رومز ما في مكان ما في اسره ف كما ابو زيد ما غزيت الدكاتره جالسين ينتظرون اسره حتى يشتغلوا على المرضى لكن للاسف انه ما في بيدز افيلبل تو سي ا نيو بيشنت كوفيد انكريز نمبر اوف بيدز ان ايمرجنسي ديبارتمنت يمكن كثير من اللي يشتغلوا في التاشري هوسبيتال في الرياض وجده وفي الشرقيه زودوا عدد الاسره في الطوارئ لكن اكتشفوا انه ما ما صار شيء انه طالما ان الاسره ما تحركت داخل المستشفى ما راح تتحرك في الطوارئ وحيصير عندك الباك فلو للامرجنسي. في مشكله برضه بتصير احيانا مع لما يصير في اوفر كلاودنس في الامرجنسي بيصير في كنسل الالكتف بروسيجرز وكثير من الاحيان الالكتف بروسيجر هذه شود بي انيشيتد فاست تو تريت ذا بيشنت فاني ديلي في الالكتف بروسيجرز تو بي ريفلكت على البيشنت البيشنت حيتحول من الكتف الى امرجنسي. وحيجيك الطواري باي سيك زي مثلا البروسيجر حقت الدياجنوستيك كاف تاخرت لانها دياجنوستيك كاف حيجيك الطواري بامرجنسي ام اي وحياخذ عليك سليم كذا بالطريقه هذه واحيانا برضه الري سكدولينج الاو ار برضه هذه برضه المرضى اللي حيصير لهم ري سكدولينج حيتركوا الاو بي دي وحيجوك عن طريق الطواري تو بي جيتن فاست تو ذا بروسيجر ED should solve their own overcrowdness. وهذا دائما كانت تصير ديسكشن هذا زمان لكن الحين الحمد لله مع وصول الزملاء الحين في الاي ار لل لل كهاير ادمنستريشنز وفي الكلاسترز they start to transfer المسج حقتنا للناس الموجودين هناك وبداوا يعرفون شغل الطوارئ بشكل لانه الطوارئ 
ما حد يعرف شغلها الا اللي يشتغل داخل الطوارئ فيها واللي كان يشتغل زمان مو زي اللي يشتغل الان في فرق بين المجموعتين فذي ذي شود بي سولف ذير اون بروبلمز نو ذس نوت ترو اند ذير از نوثينج ماي ديبارتمنت كان دان اباوت يو سو ماي بيشنت ذي ويل ستي فور لونجر في ان بيشنت واحيانا ذي نوت كيبينج مور اتنشن باي ذا كونسلتور ستاف فالبيشنت حياخذ اسر اكثر ولونجر في ان ان بيشنت الاوفر كراود سير سوليوشنز احنا لازم نفكر من كل النواحي بس سمبل هير از سمبل از ذات ليتس ثينك اباوت ال 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 patient input with through output will patient output طيب let's look one one by one for this solution here Because of ED crowdness here for patient input, uh, input of patient to the ED is lack of easy access to the primary care. Uh, public education's measurement, use of ED for access to specialty physicians, while we have now, it may cause uh, many times many problems here because uh, patient is low acuity, but they fight to come inside the emergency, or they want to come to inside the emergency for the subspecialty uh, physicians. Uh, most of the time, we solve it by the primary health care. Those we can uh, refer the patient to the subspecialty, not by the ER. Use of the ED for uh, uh, uninsured, uh, non eligible, non urgent patient. This is not in Saudi Arabia, but it's uh, happened in the Western countries because uh, many patients they have uninsured, so they, they will go to the emergency to solve their problems. When I, what I know that we will have some insurance here for all the civilian and citizen here in, the, in Saudi Arabia. So those who haven't, who have, do, those who don't have an insured, they will go to the emergency to be treated as top urgent case there. And the, the population, the population if it's uh, getting older, uh, this is one of the main concerns. And older and elderly people, they take uh, bits for longer than you, uh, longer time inside the hospital. The high acuity patient population in the community will elderly be increased. Need to keep an eye on that. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, you may be here in Saudi Arabia. Most of the populations, I think, you know, more than 50 something, as the youth and younger than 35 years old. The <coughs> patient flow through the ED, through outputs, either in the shortage for medical and nursing staff, we can have clearly been seen it. Uh, during the COVID uh, period, an efficient ED process. If you have ED process, you get a nice job. We have the flow uh, of the patients, uh, clinical flow, uh, order sets. This will uh, make some, some of the physicians, especially the new physicians who start to work in emergency, being confused how to solve this patient. Shortage of the floor space. Like what we see in the pictures here, increasing the age, complexity, and the acuity of the patient presenting to the emergency. Out, but how to to uh, try to transfer patient from emergency here because of the uh, we have many problems here regarding either to lack of inpatient bed for admitted uh, emergency patient. Uh, here's one of the issues here when you have a senior consultant inside the emergency, and you want to uh, refer patient. Uh, for admission or to subspecialty, uh, there isn't our training. They start to review the orders and there will be conflict with the physicians. Uh, this is not under my why you want to admit him uh, like that. And this maybe sometimes uh, we not to say take up to 12 hours or 14 hours. So sometimes we need to solve it by senior consultant or the, the consultant. He can make direct admission to the specialty. Long inpatient care process that's unnecessary for long average of length of stay in the world. Uh, forced discharge, uh, had to discharge a patient quickly from the emergency. Uh, lack of home care, lack of long staying facilities, uh, seasonal variation in the area of crowdness, especially you now we are starting to have a winter time now, so expecting to have more flow of the patient to the emergency. <coughs> 
احنا لنا تجربه يمكن في في العسكري الان وي ستارت تو هاف ريد اند جرين سو ذا بيشنت نيد تو بي ايفالويتد اند اسس اند رايد ذا شارج بيشنت بيفور 12 كلوك بي ام سو اول ذا ميديكيشنز اند انستراكشنز فور ذا بيشنت ويل بي ريدي بيفور 3 كلوك بي ام What's the problem? So the problems of the emergency here, ED for homeless, is everyone a problem, all level of the hospitals, not only the emergency. The problem for our us, emergency, uh, we, uh, we are responsible about it. If you don't have effective uh, flow of the patients inside the emergency, hospital management, public health authorities. Measurement of ED crowdness here, we have too many, too many rules uh, to, to measure the ED crowdness. One of that is to, to look to the length of stay or the board patient times from door to, be to, the, to the dispositions, which is not be supposed to be exceeding more than four hours. But look, let us look here to the Canadian uh, uh, measurement agency for drugs and technology here in healthcare. Let's uh, look to the 10 criteria here. Uh, number one is uh, percentage of the AD occupancy by the inpatient total. ED patient, number of patients in the ED, including even the corridors or the chair in the hallway, and also in the waiting room. Also need to be calculated here. Overall bed occupancy daily in emergency, total time in ED, length of stay from first triage assessment to the leaving department. And we need to put figures or alarming. Once the patient starts to be close to the four hours, some of the hospitals, they start now to make it two and a half hours. This depends on the acuity of the patient, CTAS, level one, two, three. Percentage of the time of the day that ED has more patient than uh, state bid capacity. Time from bid request to bid assignment is very important. Uh, so I have patient need to be uh, transferred to the ward. So I already make request. How long to receive replay from the, in, uh, from the inpatient or from the ward that patient already accept? It's supposed to be not more than one hour, by the way. <clears throat> Time of bed ready to transfer to the ward, also this is not supposed to be more than four hours, maximum. Time from triage to emergency physicians, MD satisfactions, and number of staff, acute care beds. It's very important here. <clears throat> there are some measurements that every physician is supposed to be seen, if he's junior, uh, two, two and a half patients per hour. Uh, seniors, they will have uh, they were seen one, uh, one and a half patient per hours. Uh, but overall, we need to be quickly uh, sort the patient, acute and non-acute inside the emergency. This is another uh, tools for measurement of the ED crownness called Edwin, this American style. <coughs> uh, it's mean Edwin, that's meaning emergency department work index. It's combined of number of patients, a little bit uh, it's simpler than Canadian, by the way but uh, need more calculations and a statistic. It's a combined of number of patients, triage level, number of physicians, bid spaces, and admitted patients remaining in the emergency. Patient triage unit, per attending physicians, per available bid. Uh, and actual Edwin, Edwin uh, Emergency Department Work Index uh, is having uh, good uh, and excellent correlation between the score and for the recruitment of nurse, and physicians that actually you need them inside the emergency. Simple measurement here, when the physician and nurses start to feel rushed, had a had an absent soil uh, or measurement, you can use it inside the emergency for crowdness. <clears throat> okay, uh, solutions. Solutions. Uh, there is many solutions for that. It's, uh, as I mentioned, it, we are part of it. The solutions, not the whole solutions in the emergency. Uh, either we need to solve the patient coming to the emergency, or through about the process, uh, the process inside the emergency, or disposition of the patient from emergency. Uh, think as a director here of the hospital. If you are a director of the hospital, uh, we need to look to the bids in all department and how the special be utilizing their, uh, their bits. How they make disposition of the patient <clears throat> and the, the effective of the sharp patient from the ward to the home. 
be careful about a critical area, ICU, PICU, per unit, and be highly careful about it. And uh, because if left without monitors, uh, uh, after five years, you need to have a 60 bit ICU inside the emergency. The beds inside the hospital will be not, not enough. So you need to have effective and very good physicians working in, in critical area. Operative rooms, you need to keep an eye on it and how being utilized and how many patients seen and the turnover uh, from OR from patient to patient. Beds in emergency area and looks at the effective, the OBD there. Because if the OBD not receiving enough patient, uh, the remaining will go to the emergency. Uh, as emergency director here, uh, think about the process, procedure or process in the, in the triage area to sort it out. So you need to keep about the triage, uh, uh, triaging uh, assessment scores. Uh, so the effective disposition of the patient to which area or transfer the patient to which area, either to go to the recess home, uh, to the critical area level two, uh, to the fast track level three or super fast track urgent care unit. Uh, and uh, sometimes if you open the fast track too much, it will attract more patients. So this will not be solutions to expand the bids in the fast track. You need to think about how to make it effective process inside the emergency. Keep an eye carefully about the length of stay, time to disposition of the patient, protocols and guidelines, order set. Uh, if you need, you need to be do it more and more. So the new physicians or the overtimers or coming from other areas, or even the physicians or work seniors, the emergency, they can uh, make a quick uh, assist the patients and a quick disposition of the patient. And also decrease, the, the, the protocols will decrease also the conflict between the emergency and the subspecialty. <clears throat> so here's the input, input, think about the triage. And sometimes in case of overcrowdedness, we may sometimes for low acuity patients for like level four and five, will price them to the urgent care center or to the primary care, which is supposed to be very close to the emergency. And under the last even around one and one and a half kilometers between the emergency and the primary care. five minutes to arrive to the emergency there. Effective registrations, especially the registration supposed to be on bedside. So once the patient assigned the triage from the triage, you can make the registration there and instead to make uh, unnecessary steps, patient supposed to go through the visual triage, from the visual triage, he the triage. بعد ما يخلص التراج يأخذ الرقم كم تراج حقه يروح للريسبشن ويسوي له ريجستريشن هناك لا إحنا we need to make it smooth and fast the registration there through uh, through output here the procedures policy order set labs radiology and consultation should be effective and not to be over utilized especially the advanced imaging like ultrasound or CT scan uh, if you have some staff who are requesting a lot of radiology unnecessarily this will be badly reflect uh, to your uh, to the emergency. An output discharge, transfer, consultations, uh, admissions, and transfer from emergency to the inpatient. <clears throat> Any input here solutions? Okay, advice fine. telephone. Yes. Uh, you have one. So to get better on Yeah, I I, I mean. I cannot hear you, Dr. Mohammed. Wait, uh, I'll start with a few slides. The input, as I said, the health care is the telephone advice lines. Supposed to be, you know, maybe the experience can be with a physician to be better, but can be combined with nurses and physicians for a phone receiving call. Public education, triage with the patient, physician, the triage sometimes. But don't me make it over uh, because this will lead to the delay. Physician, let me come to the triage, we can make a short triage. Like, let me come one to effective, we can make it fast for the triage. Increase reliance on home based care and community outreach uh, programs. Collocate the primary care physicians to see the non critical patient. Early identification of complex cases, uh, sometimes from the waiting area, bedside registration. ED observation unit. So the patient, بعد ما تخلص منه بعد ساعتين ثلاث ساعات, حطه في observation unit. We take your time up to six hours there. Complete non-critical workup. يعني don't delay the admission علشان the non-critical workup تأخرت. That you can admit the patient 
if it's non critical workup like in the ultrasound I'll show you this is amendocytes I need to wait uh, areas common uh, most of working in emergency you know this area very well fast track urgent care main area short stay critical area and the most important area is the recess area uh, ED output solutions here how to discharge the patient from emergency create institution awareness direct admission right from ED physician decrease hospital occupancy rate حاجة فيها اسمها aggressive discharge planning hospital at home hospital teams medical specialty case manager social worker ground rounds ground rounds هذا will solve a lot for admitted patient flexible surge management strategy عشان كده احنا ما نبغى نتعامل مع المرضى اللي داخل المستشفى كهوتيل سيرفيس اللي هم بيطلعوا الساعه 2 ولا يطلعوا الساعه 3 لا اللي هو ممكن كان بي ديشارج وانس ذا بيشنت جيتنج ستيبل اديشنال بيدز ان ان بيشنت هول وايز يعني بدل ما يكون عندك هول واي افتحها داخل المستشفى increase bed capacity in the healthcare system AD output solutions how to solve the access block here admit admitted patient using full hospital protocol ED core overcrowding is uh, symptoms of healthcare system try to push good leaders to be in the higher administration of the hospital thank you very much and this many reference it's good to improving the flow inside the emergency and inside the emergency emergency جزاكم الله خير دكتور محمد طيب نبدا النكست سكشن ان شاء الله دائما نبدا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونصلي ونسلم على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين سيدنا وحبيبنا عليه افضل الصلاه والتسليم سيدنا محمد عليه افضل الصلاه والسلام Uh, the, the next lecture is about the pediatric neurology that we see in the emergency. Uh, I know we take around one hour in the overcrowd, so hopefully we'll uh, we'll make it shorter, inshallah, in, uh, in this, uh, inshallah. Hopefully within 25 or 30 minutes, it will be completed, inshallah. Uh, the objective here to understand the migraine, uh, we will not talk about the common neurology that everyone knows about the pediatric emergency. We we'll talk about something is really uncommon uh, seen in emergency because you know neurology is big wide uh, topics uh, to cover it uh, here. So let us focus on the understanding of the migraine in the pathophysiology and the management, and discuss the difference between types of seizures that are present to the childrens, and provide a different diagnosis for children with ataxia. Maybe we see it a lot, you know, um, the patients who present to the attacks, there will be a lot of confused, the management, and uh, yeah, either to the char, not to char the patient, um, requ requesting, uh, requesting uh, advanced imaging or not requested, requesting toxic screen or not requested. There is a lot of confusion about this area. Discuss various cases of weakness in kids. <clears throat> we'll talk about briefly about the headache, seizures, ataxia, and weakness. So what is this picture? So if you just, if you can mention it in the chat, what is this picture looks like? What does this picture look like? If you can't see this picture, oh, head trauma, skull trauma. Okay. What else? Uh, the step one. The head trauma is not including in this picture. فهذه uh, as simple as that uh, this is uh, a picture for migraine by the way yes this this looks like a headache this is a migraine why it's unilateral it's throbbing it's increasing with the movement moderate to severe so it's unilateral throbbing And severe, if the patient can't move his head. Once he's moving, he will have more pain. So this is a simple picture for how those uh, patients who are having migraine, how they are feeling. <coughs> so migraine headaches, uh, we'll talk about many types. The common uh, types uh, that we've seen in an emergency, either the common migraine, it's the classic one, uh, the, the common migraine, which is there is no aura. It's coming sudden. Onset and sudden offset. Uh, the classic migraine, no, the patients start to have some uh, aura, 
uh, feeling, sm smelling, uh, seeing some uh, uh, something white or black dots in front of his face. So he's he have experience that he's going to start this migraine. Uh, the worst one, the the, the complicated migraines, is, is that's been associated with transit neurological disturbance. What is this one? This is uh, a common, uh, this is one of the cases, is that common actually, uh, present to the emergency, uh, and sometimes being confused, is it gastroenteritis, is it stroke, something neurology, uh, we don't know what's going on there, but actually this is uh, the classic of occipital headache, this arteria, the patient starts to be confused, a having paresthesia unilaterals in one side, uh, and once the patient's getting more pain, more pain, more pain, then they start to vomit, the, the vomit will relieve the headache. All the issues, these. once the patient vomit, all this one will be resolved. This is called basilary artery migraine. And it's a common area to be confusing with a stroke for head trauma, for gastroenteritis, for this one. And the patient has repeated. And the mother will mention the history, my child is having this frequent, having uh, this artery, having occipital headache here. A having the vertigo, a having paresthesia unilaterals, but once she vomit, everything will be solved. This is basilary artery migraine. Uh, basilary migraine uh, is, is associated with ataxia, vertigo, headache, headache followed with ataxia, vertigo, can have transit, uh, lose of consciousness, but it's not common. Uh, the French diagnosis, we need to be keep an eye on that, especially if it's acute to the emergency. It's not something chronic. Think about tumor, stroke, temporary lobe seizures. So the pathophysiology of migraines here, what's going on there? Why are they having this migraine? You know, this is start from platelet. Platelet will increase more serotonin, which is something a very good uh, hormones here inside our body, serotonin. It's very beautiful for happiness. But increasing level of serotonin in the brain will make vasoconstrictions. If you have a type of classic type of migraine, they will start to have an aura here and start to feel something before the migraines. Uh, here we're having hypoxia, acidosis, lactic acidosis, start to be accumulated inside the brain, negative feedback, so serotonin will be getting less and start to have vasodilation, blood will come again to the brain and start to wash less acidosis and lactic acid. And here we have the bad things, the pain. Once we been transit from vasoconstriction to vasodilation, here we'll have to start to have the severe pain or the headache. Treatment of migraine is too many, uh, there's many optionals by the, by the pediatric neurology. Most of the time we are the treating the emergency or the primary health care. And sometimes in complicated case, will be sent to the uh, neurology to be sorted out there. Simple is uh, paracetamol or acetaminophenes, non-steroidal, especially the ibuprofen, anti-emetic, blazil or metacolbromide, uh, especially for, for older patients. We don't like to use it for younger uh, kids. I send an extra pyramidal signs. We can use safely also the anti-sterone, dancesterone to work. Uh, also, uh, many times it work well with the patient, especially in the emergency. Triptans, ergotamine, also this will prevent the vasoconstrictions, uh, this one. Just give me one minute. Sorry, uh, triptans, uh, you can use the um, soma, Risa and Zolomitriptan. Uh, Somatriptan is the commonest one using sub-Q, six milligram auto-injector, or the simple one is nasal uh, spray. We have, there is uh, two types, either the five milligram or 20 milligrams unit. Risa, triptan, five milligram in kids or 10 milligrams in the olders. Um, uh, triptan 2.5. Uh, this, the, the one is easy because it's oral or five milligrams nasal. Prophylaxis, prophylaxis, uh, sometimes the neurology they will start anti-epileptic like uh, topamax, phenylpropic acids, and gabapentins. Anti-depression sometimes of amitriptylines, beta blocker, propranolol, but make sure this patient is not asthmatic patient. 
آه، ادرز لايك ريجو فلافين في كمان برضه سي كيو 10 هذا بنشوفه كثير في الاعلانات حقتنا على لطف ادفرتايزنج اند اي هير بروتيلز ذير از سم توكن اباوت ات تو بروفلاكتيك فور ذا ميجرين بس ستيل ذير از نو كلير ستدي فور ذات سيجرز وي هاف تو تايبز مينلي سيجرز او جنراليز او بارشل جنراليز از بوث افكت بوث هيمسفير از ان كونفولسيف تايب او كونفولسيف تايب Partial, it's affect one hemisphere only. Simple, uh, which is make normal conscious or complex to affect the conscious level impair or that is associated with loss of consciousness. So, a question here. A question here. This is, uh, uh, this is a question for you. This is a five-year-old present with an intermittent episode of eye blinking and lip smacking and then get sleep, what's the character of her seizures? Is it simple partial or complex partial or absent? Any answer, please? Before we go to the, to the solutions, C, absent. C, absent. No, simple atrial. A, B, A, B. Okay, okay, okay. Simple. Why simple? Why simple? The patient is get sleepy, so this affect conscious. For this is complex partial. Let's go here. This is a complex part because the conscious is impaired here. It, there is no normal conscious here. The child go to sleep, so this is a complex partial. <clears throat> absent versus complex partial. Uh, absent there is no aura. In the complex there is yes. Automatism there is yes. Yes in both. Post ectal, there is no post ectal in the absence, and the complex partial, there is post ectal symptoms. So let us differentiate between Ronaldic, Quist, or Lilox uh, type of seizures here. So it's B, yeah, it's B questions. Uh, which one between this all three happened? After awake from sleep, and they will come to your emergency panic to the parents. My child getting seizures here. Which one? Is it benign, Ronaldic epilepsy, or WIS syndromes, or Linux case? No. Okay, Ronaldic, Ronaldic. Okay. So this is usually happened in the adolescence or younger age, more than four years. This is this Ronaldic has happened, and happened after awake from sleep. Uh, either unilateral or generalized, it's affected face and arm and leg movements, and there is a gargling for that. Uh, it doesn't need treatment, Ronaldic, or no? There is any treatment? Yeah, there is no treatment. There is no treatment. Like, which one happened in infant? WIST or Linux? Okay, it's having an infant between three and eight months. And if it, that's what we call it infantile spasm. You need to be careful about it because if you keep it late, the bonus will, net, will be bad. Sudden tonic contractions and hypersythmia. Uh, a lot of seizures, bad prognosis. Uh, the patient will, will be the bonus is not good. Which one is Linux? Myoclonic epilepsy of Jans, it's chromosomal abnormality occurring early morning, provoked by the sleep, the abbreviations, and alcohol ingestion. Teenagers and myoclonic. Management of seizures here, long term, uh, benign Ronaldic epilepsy, most of the time we don't need a treatment, but sometimes we can start on carbamazepine. Infantile spasm, uh, cortisone, we'll start, Linux, valeboric acid. And sometimes aggressive ketogenic diet, which would be started in ICU first before uh, transfer to the home. Absent, valeboric, or ethyl, uh, uh, myoclonic of Jans, valeboric acid. Nigel uh, will come now to that with a simple febrile seizures here. Can be started. For Ronaldic uh, epilepsy, but not all the cases. 
A simple febrile seizure, as everyone knows about it, uh, clearly it's generalized. Duration is supposed to be not more than five minutes. Uh, age is six months to six years. And actually, there's update in American Academy of Pediatric uh, every year for definition of simple febrile seizures. It happened within 24 hours of the startling illness. Is not necessarily to have fever during the time of the seizure. Maybe having fever in the last 24 hours. So I have a common mistake. It's not all the patients who present to the emergency with febrile convulsion be having fever. No, maybe you need to have a history that's having fever within within 24 hours from the presenting to the to the emergency. EEG is normal, neurodevelopmental normal, prognosis hagum alhamdulillah is normal, excellent. Be having some post ectal CBD uh, for 30 minutes, then they will be supposed to be wake clearly, no lethargic. No, they are supposed to resume their activity fully. Uh, family history, history, especially from the mother side or between the girls, usually present. Simple febrile convulsions uh, evaluations. If there is no source of fevers and the child is younger than one year, especially you need to consider UTI and bacteremia for the old age. LB. Yes, consider it below one year, very low thresholds for LB, for the patient less than one year, especially if it's unimmunized or partially treated with antibiotic. What about CTAS, seizures lab? Yeah, CTAS when we be not classical uh, febrile convulsion or being focal. Uh, status of epilepsy, the definitions, seizures more than 15 minutes to 30 minutes. Uh, or they're having more frequent sequential seizures, you know, on and off seizures, or a child is not, or the patient is not fully recovering from the seizures, like having was ectal, and he didn't wake up after that, stay for the, more than 30 minutes. So consider this is a part of the status epilepsy. And status epilepsy in a febrile evaluation, we need to first check all the vital signs, uh, check the oxygen saturation, also, don't forget the glucose. Consider electrolyte, calcium, magnesium, phosphorate, especially if less than six months. Risk factor of that of vomiting, diarrhea, and dysmorphisms. So something inside the brain, we don't know what's going on inside the brain. He need to be a uh, CTAS the patient. I mean, uh, to do, uh, do CTA, C, C, CT for the patient. Talk screen, don't forget about it, especially if there's no clear what's going on. And what's the cause for the seizure here? EEG also being need, <clears throat> especially for the status to know that patient is still in set, still firing his brain with uh, with seizures. Uh, insufficient evidence here to support routine blood cultures, especially if the patient's have a prior or lumbar puncture or routine neuroimaging. But most of the time, if you don't have clear reason for that, go ahead for CT. But don't don't hesitate for that. Do it. It is go what's going on inside the emergency, inside the brain, especially if it's for the first time presenting with this status. Indication for a CT in the seizures in the child, partial seizures or vocal, more than one attack of seizure at the same time, focal EEG, focality, there is focality in EEG, abnormality in the exams, uh, question about abuse, infant, so, so there's something inside the brain, hemorrhage, whatever. First attack of seizures, let's just think about it, especially if it's not clear or prolonged at, uh, first attack. Evaluation, in neonatal with seizure, need to be including glucose, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, all the electrolyte, metabolic screen, ammonia, ammonia, organic acid, urine, and in the serum. Uh, the first line in the emergency here, you know, we are using lorazepam, dazepam, midazolam, second line, phosphinitoin, phenytoin, phenobar, Third line, valeboric acid or Kepra. We'll go to the dose now. It's very simple for lorazepam is 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, even 0 0.3. Also, the dazepam, the same dose 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Sometimes we'll go with 0 0.3 to have more effect of the medication. Valeboric acid 20, Kepra is 20. So, all the same dose. Kibra, there's some study you can go up to 40, 40 milligrams per kg. Don't forget about the dextrose, milligrams IV. No IV access, use the Zibam rectal, it is in the buccal area, but this will be five times the dose, 0.5 milligram per kg. 
midazolam, so 0.15 mg IM is not more anymore recommended, and there is no benefit from that. Fisphenitoin, IM 20 mg, but also is not recommended. Midazolam, 0.2 mg per kg intranasal. Actually, they start to use it now one of the first line <clears throat> before they're getting IV access to use the intranasal for midazolam. Very effective. Ataxia. Let's go questions here about the ataxia, the most common cause of chronic intermittent ataxia in kids. What is it? Especially if it's 10 years or 12 years old girl. We'll make it simple. Is it basilary artery migraine, encephalitis, cerebral mass, acute cerebral ataxia? What's the question here? What's the answer here, sorry? Baroduxin, we use it especially in infant, less than six months with frequent seizure in emergency. So we can use it as a trial, 50 to 100 milligrams per kg. The most common IQ of chronic intermittent ataxia, basilary migraine, encephalitis, cerebral mass, acute cerebral ataxia. A, B, C, D. No. The most common cause of chronic intermittent picture is based on vertigo, occipital headache, paresthesia, unilaterals. Once the patient starts to vomit, it will relieve. This is the difference between ataxia, uh, acute, and chronic. Uh, our major issues here about the acute uh, cause para infectious, acute cerebralitis, infectious meningitis, encephalitis, post traumatic, ischemic, vascular like Moya Moya, for example, syndromes, uh, posterior fossa tumor, transfer myelitis, uh, polyneuritis, intoxication. Progressive the chronic, here will be considerable tumors, abscess inside the brain, intermittent migraine seizures, MS, non-progressive like CP, cerebral agenesis. Right. Another question here. <clears throat> Three year old present with intermittent episode of crying. Three years old present with intermittent episode of crying. Closing your eye, turn it pale, vomit. Her gait is acidic during this episode. He's fine afterwards. There is family history of migraine. The most likely difference is perilymphatic fistula, Meniere's disease, benign bruxismal vertigo, Ramsey Hunt. What's the answer? D, okay. D, no, B, okay. D, D, D. So you're confusing us between D capital and small and B small and B capital. Okay, good. So what's the answer here? And the frequent, so and the steady value. And again, also one of the part of the benign process of vertigo. Okay. I'll, uh, let's speak about uh, benign paroxysmal vertigo here. Benign paroxysmal vertigo. Benign paroxysmal vertigo. This is common uh, sometimes in small kids, adults, and any age. I think the benign paroxysmal vertigo has been one of the commonest uh, delay staff in emergency to attend the shift on time. Have benign paroxysmal vertigo. Once he's awake, he starts to have vertigo and he wants to vomit or something. And this is one of the commonest make staff who call him the field with the and the Here, the benign paroxysmal vertigo has Migraine variant, age between one and six years, cannot stand plus minus support. This looks like drunk, sudden and brief, sudden onset, sudden offset, autonomic symptoms, like vomiting, pale, sweating, no loss of consciousness, no headache here. So this is benign bruxism alpha vertigo. Acute attacks, yeah? We mentioned before a bara infections, infection, uh, post traumatic, ischemic vascular, posterior fossa tumor, transverse myelitis, polyneuritis, intoxication. 
التي سي اي والالكوهول والانتي كونفولزنت هذه عاده تكون من البيرنتس وان دي ليد ات اند كيدز ويل جيت اكسس تو ذات So be careful in the history to take about all the drug medication inside the hospital and inside the home. Uh, para infections uh, that's causing acute cerebral ataxia, onset days to weeks, age between one to three years, mental status is normal, appear well, neuro exam normal, a calcium gate can have dysmetria, nystagmus, and dysarthria. CSF here will be normal. Uh, prognosis is excellent and self limit and recovery from days to six day weeks. 10 to 20 percent they have some sequels, but later on, inshallah, they will have they will be recovered. Uh, dizzy, dizziness is a uh, differential diagnosis here either bisillary artery migraine, female adolescents, headache, occipital headache, can have loss of consciousness, brief, vomit will relieve it. Benign paroxysmal vertigo is different, it's between one to six years, no headache. No loss of consciousness. There is a pain, nausea, vomit, but here the vomit, vomit will not relieve the vertigo like what happened in the basilary artery migraine. Basilary artery migraine, they will be relieved with vomit. Acute cerebral ataxia. Uh, this happened between one to three years. No headache, no loss of consciousness will appear in class longer than uh, than than basilary uh, uh, than the proximal vertigo. Post viral. Uh, we sometimes we need the CT scan for this patient to rule out other issues or specific migraine in the brain, especially if it's acute. Ataxic transfer myelitis, uh, which is sometimes confused with trauma or whatever, because the child will be suddenly, you'll be awake, and suddenly he will fall down. So we think there is some trauma to the neck or cervical. CT scan is not sometimes helpful here. <clears throat> And you need to go to the MRI to detect the, where is the transfer of myelitis happened. Patient will start to have ataxia or loss of movement, back or neck pain, paresthesia, and then the weakness below the level of lesions, rapid progressions, 45% worse in the next 24 hours. So this may be trauma, not because of transfer of myelitis. We need to be careful attention for this. Ataxia transfer myelitis. Uh, that could be following the infection, viral or bacterial, because of the autoimmune response. SLE, MSC gravitis, MS, uh, paraneoplastic, vascular, thrombus, or AV malformation. This is how can we detect the transfer myelitis in MRI. <clears throat> so here, let's go here about uh, the weakness. How can we differentiate? This is upper motor neuron lesions or this is lower neuron lesions. What's the difference? How can we, we differentiate between this? Yeah, as simple as that, upper motor neuron diamond, it's work like a brake for the muscle, for the, for the nerve. It will work like a brake. Once the brake is broken or not working, everything will be increased because this will be controlling the speed and controlling the, 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 the muscle power, the upper motor. The lower neuron lesions here, no, it's at speed, once this one is not working, everything will go down if the lower neuron being affected. So upper motor neuron lesions, uh, it's asymmetrical, symmetrical or asymmetrical. Muscle tone here is increased. Deep tendon reflexes increase. Abmesky will be up. And muscle atrophy, fasciculations, no. But because here the speed uh, or the engine broke in here, so the muscle tone will be decreased. Deep tendon reflex will be decreased. Abmesky will go down. And the muscle atrophy, because the, the, the power of the muscle will be uh, affected, it will be, uh, there will be atrophy or fasciculation there. Uh, upper motor neural region here will, uh, will walk, that's act, act as a break for the, the muscle power. Uh, either to have hemiplegia, brain infection, or hemorrhage, or paraplegia, lower half, spinal cord, sorry, spinal artery occlusions, or transverse myelitis. Any two of us, because uh, I talk from your time here. Lower motor neuron disease, uh, either to have anterior ho horn cell, like Wording Hoffman, polymyelitis, uh, peripheral nerve, like GPS, uh, Guillain Barr syndromes, and uh, be careful about Guillain Barr syndrome. This is one of the diagnoses can be missed in emergency. So we need to be, keep, uh, be careful about it. 
especially if the child starts to be uh, have weakness lower limb. So not to be confused, is it ataxia or actually he's in progressive GPS. Neuromuscular junctions, uh, tick paralysis, metabolisms, organophosphate, myasthenia, muscle weight disease, new, uh, muscular dystrophy, and myopathies. Guillain Barr syndrome, uh, actually, it's one of my nightmares uh, not to be missed in emergency. It's acute demyelination, polyneuritis, the neuropathy, uh, followed by the viral infection or GI symptoms, one to two weeks. It's ascending from lower extremity to the upper extremity until you have respiratory muscle paralysis. Uh, uh, it's usually symmetrical, but sometimes can be asymmetric. There will be areflexia, necessary to have areflexia, and there's pain and paresthesia. Lumbar puncture indicated here to, have to see the albumin and the protein, the CSF, and elevated protein, but they will have normal uh, WBC and glucose level in the CSF fluid. A simple picture here, it's coming from down to up, and the resolution from up to down, and the progressive from hours to days, we don't know, that's why patient, all the patients, we need to keep them in ICU for possible intervention, advanced airway anytime. So it prepare your ET tube, sedation, everything. We can intubate the patient anytime. Like symptom weakness, but can be asymmetric and 9% progressive proximally history of URTI and absent deep tender reflex and flex. This is generalized paralysis, no sensory deficits, deep, deep, deep tender reflex decrease. I've been shown two cases actually. The paralysis will be continued until you're discovering where is this the happened, the ticks, and you need to remove it. And within hours, the patient will resume his, uh, his activity. Remove the tick. What is this? Everyone know about it? So Bell's palsy, it's followed by, by herpes, or either to start up on the NDAs, sometimes need to bring, sometimes not need to bring, temporarily bone CT scan if we need it. Think about trauma or abscess or prolong uh, the recovery patches so you can save the, the cornea when it be dry. We'll go to the upper motor neuron lesions here, hemiplegia, one side, brain infection, hemorrhage, or paraplegia, the lower half, spinal cord compression, spinal slide. Any questions, please? Thank you so much for everyone. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Saleh, for and <clears throat> I hope my voice now is clear. Is it clear my voice? Okay, in the emergency, usually in the emergency department, there is so many uh, actually uh, uh, people facing this problem. And sometimes they are reluctant to do uh, procedure sedation or to give some medications, which can cause uh, a lot of uh, discomfort for the family when you have a, like a child who's coming with a laceration or some injury that need to be uh, sutured or to be treated and he needs some pain relief or some sedation, okay? <clears throat> and uh, as you know, this is uh, considered now one of the important, uh, one of the important presentation to the emergency department. Uh, in one study, it's been mentioned that more than 80% they present to the emergency with pain, uh, especially in children. And uh, usually you have to start and pain management, usually it is ignored in most of the uh, places and they are underestimating the pain. Yani, and I feel really uh, uh, sorry for this uh, pediatric, especially pediatric population when they come and they are in pain 
and they need some uh, relief from their pain. Uh, just imagine this is your uh, kids or your, okay? So I think we should uh, be careful for our uh, patient pediatric population coming to the emergency department, okay? I know we have some of our nurses uh, with us here in the audience and they are doing excellent job in the emergency department, okay? And they are trying their best really uh, to uh, relieve pain from children especially when they come to the doctor and tell them that doctor, he's in pain, we need to give him some medication. Can we give him paracetamol? Can we give him ibuprofen? Can we give him, for example, morphine? And they have the right to discuss the case with the physician and to see what they can do. <clears throat> uh, my uh, objectives for my presentation, definition about uh, what is the procedure sedation, and what is the guidelines? And we'll talk about the medication regime that we are using, in, uh, which is very important, actually, especially for those who are not uh, <clears throat> familiar with this medication. I think it's very important to know. Um, just to have a cl different clinical scenario that we used to see most of the time in the emergency, those who are requiring uh, uh, treatment, uh, and re requiring sedation or <clears throat> like six year old he, who needs a uh, CT and uh, to rule out uh, VP shunt malfunctioning or to rule out uh, intracranial bleed or whatever child who's coming to the emergency with headache or with uh, head injury. Okay, so what kind of medication, what is the best that you should give to this uh, child? Also, another case who is uh, seven years old, uh, who's coming with, <clears throat> with wound, uh, forehead laceration or anywhere laceration, and he needs the suture. So also he needs some medication to be given. Uh, also the last case, which is uh, the severe pain, like a child who is six years old coming with the ulna, radius ulna fracture, and he needs a, a close reduction. This need more stronger sedative and analgesic also. So I'm going to talk about all these, but let us just give you some introduction about the uh, procedure sedation before we go to the managing these cases. Okay. And if you have any questions, please, you can put it on uh, chat area. Okay. <clears throat> okay, what is the definition of uh, procedure sedation? As every and most of you are aware, this is an administrative or administering or given a sedatives or dissociative uh, medication uh, with analgesic and sedative effect, okay? And uh, <clears throat> that will make the child, okay, or the patient will tolerate uh, the unpleasant procedure while maintaining his cardiovascular function. I hope this is very clear and very simple. <clears throat> Okay. I'm struggling here with my screen because I'm trying to look at the chat at the same time to my slides. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so it is given sedative or analgesic to make the child tolerate the procedure without uh, 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 pain, okay? and uh, without also cardiorespiratory uh, depression. So this is very important. And, uh, <clears throat> and we have to be careful because sometimes we have cases that we cannot do conscious sedation or procedural sedation. For example, like infant less than three to six months of age. Sometimes we go up to even less than three. In some hospital, maybe less than one year, they are reluctant to do a uh, conscious sedation or procedural sedation because they are afraid of uh, apnea or cardiorespiratory depression. Also in premature infant with the early months, uh, in early months of life, uh, 
history of apnea or breathing disorder, uh, cardiorespiratory disease. You have to be careful when you are given pre-sedation to this patient. Also renal and hepatic neuromuscular disease. This is very important. Patient with, <clears throat> with the infection, upper respiratory infection or asthmatic patient, you have to be also careful uh, when you give the uh, sedation. But sometimes if you are forced, you can give, but under monitoring. And this is very important. You have to be also skillful in intubation and in having all the equipments, having everything. Okay. There is a common question, and especially our colleague from orthopedic, is he fasting? Is he not fasting? Is he whatever? And uh, other specialty, they want to delay the patient to stay in, in the emergency. So that recently, and even before, actually, uh, we are following the, <clears throat> the anesthesia guidelines for uh, fasting, and there is a protocol or uh, in, in, in every hospital, okay, about uh, the fasting for patients going for procedure, okay? And uh, <clears throat> in this study, which is very interesting, more than 2,500 patients, uh, 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 they went under uh, procedural sedation uh, without fasting. And they noticed there is no association between procedural fasting and incidence of adverse effect. So, uh, so they discover that fasting, it is not necessary to be applied for children, okay? However, in uh, some guidelines, uh, the American Academy of uh, Anesthesia, still they are recommending Okay, and uh, uh, still like, uh, you know, the American Academy of uh, Anesthesia or the Society of Anesthesia, they recommend in some high risk patient where they have problem with their GI and they have problem with vomiting, still you can use this uh, duration of fasting before uh, going ahead and uh, give uh, procedural sedation. But still, I think in most of the cases, with good monitoring, there is no need to keep your child fasting, especially if you are, uh, 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 if you, especially if you are, for example, having an emergency case and you need to do it uh, very fast. Okay. <clears throat> there is someone asking: Should a doctor who have conscious sedation course to perform it even? When he is uh, skilled in it, yes, I think you still should. This is the hospital policy. For example, like an emerg I am an emergency physician. I'm doing conscious sedation or procedural sedation like almost daily, but still every year I have to renew my contract. So before I have to sit for like, you know, uh, a course to do it, which is uh, sometimes we feel it is silly, but uh, it, is, it depends on the hospital policy. Okay, uh, here, this is an, a study who showed that uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 there is a review of 22,000, 17,000 adult and almost four, uh, uh, more than 4,600, they uh, had uh, conscious sedation and it showed uh, without uh, having MPO like for, as at a time they go, went ahead and there was no bad event and there was no uh, uh, sequelae or no complication after the procedure. So this is encouraging to go ahead. Here also uh, <clears throat> in patient who's undergoing procedural sedation and analgesia in the emergency department, this is a recommendation from Annals of Emergency Medicine in 2014, uh, <clears throat> does pre-procedural sedation fasting demonstrate a reduction in the risk of emesis or aspiration? It showed no. So this is another also recommendation. So what is the contraindication? When we shouldn't uh, do the, uh, the <clears throat> conscious sedation? Actually, it is, uh, it is very clear. If you are unable to manage the airway, you shouldn't do conscious sedation. 
if you are uh, not aware of your medication, you don't know what is the pharmacokinetics, what is the medication, how does it work, uh, you have to be, uh, you shouldn't do it. Uh, also, if you don't have any uh, monitoring equipments, like for example, pulse oxy, blood pressure, now recently they are recommending also capnography, which is very uh, useful and more sensitive, more accurate than pulse oxy. And, uh, or if you have a patient with facial dental airway abnormalities, you feel it's gonna be very difficult in case the patient deteriorate and needs uh, like uh, intubation. So you have to be careful. And always, this is my advice, please call for help. Whenever you wanna do any procedure, if you are not comfortable, consult your senior or consult the anesthesia department and they may help you. Here, as I mentioned, monitoring is very important. And now just, uh, I know most of the hospital, they don't have this facility, except in the ICU, uh, it is there, the capnography, which is me measuring the CO2 on the exhaled air. It's not in the blood, okay, like pulse oxy, okay? And it is very sensitive and it's early detecting the deterioration. That's why it is now becoming very uh, uh, encouraging to use it in the emergency department, even during uh, CPR, during intubation, during uh, like uh, transferring patients from uh, one hospital to another hospital, because this can give you an early uh, assessment of any deterioration the patient may have. And also can give you uh, for early obstruction, airway obstruction or apnea, and uh, compared to the oximetry, which is can sometimes, you know, oximetry, sometimes we are facing problem with uh, the, if, if there is a poor uh, capillary refill or poor or in shock, it cannot give us a clear or an accurate oximetry result. And usually it is late. Okay, so uh, now most of the uh, advanced center or ICU, they are using capnography. In one study, they had 125 patients 14 respiratory adverse event, 11 detected before clinical exam or pulse oxy. You see, and there is, uh, this is just, in, in, uh, they, they discovered there are 14 patients who has some respiratory compromise, 11 of them, they were uh, detected by capnography. okay? And you can see, as you know, this is the wave, if you can see it, the second wave. The one in the above, the blue one is the pulse oxy. The white one is the capnography. And you can see once you exhale the CO2, it will calculate. If you exhale high CO2 up more than 45, whatever, that means there is a, a, a circulation is working and he is okay. If it is still zero, that means it is a very late and it is a very bad sign. So this is very important. Capnography is 100% sensitive and predicting hypoxic event, but unfortunately it is not a specific, but we are going with the sensitivity more than the specificity. What is your uh, discharge home criteria when you finish giving the medication and everything? Of course, this is very important. Sometimes we are in hurry to send the patient home. Okay, which is sometimes wrong and it causes some problems. So vital signs should return to the pre-procedural uh, baseline. Okay, and he should be awake, responsive, and the most important, and this is our nurses, they are yeah, observing most of the time whenever they took fluid, tolerating without vomiting, there will be no problem. Okay, uh, or absence of no... out of our uh, hands, okay, and uh, <clears throat> let me just magnify the screen, okay, okay, 
So medication, which is very important uh, part of our lecture now. And uh, so this is, uh, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, recommended medication that we used to do actually, and most of the time, uh, okay, like benzodiazepine, which is midazolam. This is a very, very famous drug that we are using most of the time in our emergency. Barbiturate, pentobarbital, it's not that much we are using. Narcotics, fentanyl, morphine, we used to uh, use it sometimes. Uh, there is another miscellaneous medication. One of the famous medications that we are using a lot, ketamine, uh, then uh, propofol, not that much. It's been used a lot in adult, but now we are using it also in pediatric population. Etomidate, uh, chloral hydrate, which is used as an outpatient sometimes for procedure, ultrasound or whatever, an ecolab or uh, reversal agent, very important. You have to be aware of it like naloxone, okay, for perpeturate, and flamazenil, which is uh, for uh, benzodiazepine. We'll start with our famous medication that we are using all the time, okay, or most of the time, okay, most of the time, sorry. Uh, midazolam. Midazolam, it's an am amnestic medication, anxiolytic sedative. It's not analgesic, by the way, because some people, they are given it, and they are doing some painful procedure. No, this is not right. It's not analgesic. Midazolam is not analgesic, okay? And uh, it has a, a synergistic effect when you give it with uh, a poid, and the dose usually 0.1 milligram per kg as an IV. Or if you don't have an IV, you can give it as an oral 0.2 to 0.5, okay? Intranasally and PR, we are using it also. What's the complication? Usually, if you give a high dose, sometimes you may face apnea, hypotension, or paradoxical agitation, okay? And uh, <clears throat> sometimes fat, respiratory depression, and apnea in case if you don't have a proper uh, monitoring or you being given a high dose by mistake. But to be honest with you, for my ex during my experience, I've been practicing now pediatric for more than like uh, uh, 20 years and nothing has happened as a complication of uh, medozolam as long you are giving the right dose. Okay. Fentanyl. Fentanyl is one of the, our uh, opioids. It's very strong, analgesic. It has no amnestic effect. Uh, and the dose usually two to three microgram. Be careful, microgram, not milligram. So fentanyl as an analgesic, we use it for painful procedure like fractures as a reduction for you know, reducing fractures. And the onset usually it takes like two minutes. So you don't have to rush. Once you give the fentanyl, wait for its effect. It takes up to two minutes. Sometimes I notice orthopedic, they start jumping on the child and start you know, reducing the fracture. I told them, hold, hold, hold. Don't do anything till I tell you. So it is your decision to give them the green light when to start doing the procedure. Also, uh, before I uh, finish talking about fentanyl, it's very important, the environment. When you are doing conscious uh, procedure sedation or conscious sedation, uh, the environment should be quiet. And sometimes I advise the nurses to turn off the light, okay? Only so to make the child feel sleepy or make uh, before giving the sedation. If you give sedation to a child who's screaming and ask the mother to put him on the patient bed, I can assure you he will not respond well to your sedation. And you have to give him again and again sedation. So I ask our nurses to keep the child in his mother lab and uh, to give the sedation, of course you have, sometimes even the child, when you put a monitor, he will scream and he will fight and he, will, he doesn't like even the pads on his chest and everything. To be honest with you, even in North America, some of our colleague, they are practicing this. They give the medication on the mother lab, okay? By the time the child starts sleepy, they put the monitors and everything and they put them in the bed. This way, you don't have to give another bolus or another medication or keep giving sedation or analgesic uh, medication. 
So we'll go back to fentanyl. Usually it takes 30 minutes. So you have to, I think 30 minutes more than enough to do any uh, painful procedure in the emergency department, of course. And usually the complication is chest wall rigidity. But luckily we don't reach this uh, complication uh, with our usual doses because uh, uh, unless the dose is more than uh, 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 180 microgram. And as you know, we never reach this uh, amount of uh, dose. Okay, so it is very rare complication as well. Okay, but what about uh, uh, and and uh, uh, what is the combination? We prefer usually sometimes to give midazolam, <clears throat> midazolam and fentanyl. Uh, and this is a study which were done uh, in uh, three hundred thirty-four patient. Okay, only eleven percent they have minor respiratory event. Okay only 11%, but in children with those who are <clears throat> under monitoring, zero life threat threaten event. So it is very safe. I know most of my colleagues and most of our pediatric, they prefer midazolam and ketamine, to be honest with you. That's why <clears throat> uh, fentanyl, they are away because of respiratory depression, but it is still a very safe medication. All right. Ketamine, this is my, to be honest with you, my favorite uh, drug. I like it and I use it most of the time. It is aministic, it is analgesic. So it has both and sedative also. So it has all the properties, not only uh, sedative, but also analgesic uh, uh, and general anesthesia also it's been used, okay? <clears throat> uh, the dose usually one to two milligram per kg IV, in younger age group, to be honest with you, I prefer to use the high dose, two milligram, to knock him down. I know some of you, they prefer to give half of the dose first, and then if it's still give him another half, this is, can be practiced. There is no wrong with it. But I prefer to knock him down from the first dose. So you can make the orthopedic people or the other uh, surgical people happy because this will knock him down and they can do the procedure very well. <clears throat> okay, uh, I, I'm talking about very young age group, like those who are uh, less than uh, five or less than 10 years. For children more than uh, 10 years of age, I prefer to give one milligram per kg or one and a half, okay? <clears throat> And try also for older age group because of this side effect, which we call it emergent uh, reactions, uh, try to uh, avoid ketamine, give fentanyl uh, much better. Because after uh, given for older children, they have more hallucination and emergence reaction and start fighting everyone, even their parents. Uh, onset usually one to five minutes. That's why you have to ask the surgeon or whatever who is doing the procedure, he should be aware, wait till you have full sedation or full analgesia effect of the medication. Okay. Uh, what about the complication? Usually increase ICP, intraocular pressure, hallucination. This complication is not that common, okay? But you have to know it, okay? So you know what you should do. Okay, so contraindicated in head injury and in, insignificant in head injury, okay? But minor head injury with laceration, sometimes we are still using ketamine, okay? Or intraorbital pressure high or ICP or psychosis. <clears throat> what, and uh, really, I know some of my colleagues or some of you, they uh, prefer to use it alone for myself because it has also a sedative effect, but for myself, I use it most of the time with midazolam because I like to have a very good effect, okay? So uh, use as an adjunct to, to with the ketamine, the midazolam, okay. Propofol, propofol, it is now one of the, uh, by the way, it's not analgesic. This is very important, not analgesic. It is a sedative medication, okay? And amnestic or effect it has, and it's been used a lot for adult, Okay, in the last many, many years. And recently we start using it in our emergency. Okay, 
And as long as you are using the right dose, don't worry, there will be no complication. The most important complication, respiratory depression and hypotension. That's why we are afraid to use it uh, that much. But still, if you are using it within the right dose, like 0.5 to one milligram per kilogram, okay, it is safe to use it, okay? And the advantage of it above ketamine, okay, the onset of action is less than one minute. So it is very fast. Okay, and also uh, if you compare it to ketamine, it would take like less than five minutes, one to five minutes. And the duration also five to seven minutes, while in ketamine, the duration, it take up to half an hour sometimes. So if, if you are doing a minor procedure, propofol will be the best. Okay, uh, uh, advantage, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the advantage, rapid induction, smooth recovery, shorter stay compared with the ketamine group. Excellent. This is a study who support also uh, the use of uh, propofol versus midazolam, also as a sedative. Okay, because midazolam, sometimes we are using it for head injury, like for CT scan, for something to do. So propofol will be even a better choice. Okay, if you are familiar with it. Okay, uh, etomidate, this is also one of the medication that we use it as a sedative only, and usually the dose is around 0.1 to 0.2 milligram. Uh, and sometimes we are using it for uh, head injury, for whatever. Okay, but you have to be careful because of adrenal suppression, we don't like it to use it, especially in patients with sepsis and suspected sepsis, okay. This study uh, compared the use of propofol versus etomidate, and you can, this is a choice study, and uh, uh, you can see from here that they are uh, preferring propofol uh, than etomidate, which I agree with it. Well, I think it is uh, better to use it, especially that uh, propofol, it has very rare uh, side effect uh, like uh, myoclonus, or uh, uh, or frequent vomiting, it has no frequent vomiting, which has uh, it with etomidate. Uh, hypotension, it is one of the uh, side effect uh, of uh, propofol, but if you give it with the right dose, uh, you can uh, avoid hypotension. Also respiratory depression, as I told you, uh, it can happen, but still, if you use it with the right dose with close monitoring, very unlikely, and the success rate most of the time approaching like 97%, which is excellent, compared to etomidate, which is around 89%. So propofol, I think now it's becoming very more and more used. What about nitrous oxide? Nitrous oxide, it is one of the excellent medication, but unfortunately, some centers, we don't have it. I think in King Fahad Medical City, they have it, okay, where you ask the child to breathe. It's himself. He is the one who will do uh, the, take it. And usually now they can do this nitrous oxide, if, even if you want to put an IV line for a child who is panic, who's afraid of needles, who's having needle phobia or any procedure, you can use uh, nitrous oxide, but it's not uh, available in, uh, in everywhere, okay? Of course, it is uh, contraindicated in patients with respiratory problem because the oxygen concentration is less uh, on nitrous uh, oxide. <clears throat> okay. What about crawler hydrate? I think most of you, those who are from Ministry of Health, they know it very well, and they are using it very well, especially in uh, radiology department when they are doing any procedure like echo or uh, uh, imaging study, MRI or uh, CT brain or whatever for outpatient, those who are coming to the radiology department. But recently, actually, we uh, try to avoid using chloral hydrate because of the uh, uh, <clears throat> of, of uh, complication, okay? And uh, also because sometimes it's not effective. Uh, <clears throat> however, in some centers, uh, they told me that it, uh, they've been using it for a long time and with a very good uh, result. And there is a wide range of uh, using the dose, yani from 50 to 75 milligram, you can uh, give per kg, okay? But you have to avoid the maximum two grams, don't give more than two grams. But the problem, 
uh, the, the effect, it will take long effect, yani three to four hours, you have to keep the patient in the uh, recovery room and the radiology department or whatever till he is fully awake. That's why the IV medication now start to be used in a very uh, big centers or those who has the uh, monitoring devices and everything so they can discharge them very uh, quickly. Okay, as you can see here in the last statement, uh, last two lines, it's been mentioned that 73% of patients has respiratory complication with chloral hydrate. That's why it's been uh, recommended not to use it anymore. Okay, well, I don't think uh, so many people, they are using it now. Okay, what about the local analgesia? If you wanna give local, for example, okay, there is a topical uh, like LET or EMLA, Topical, you know, Imla cream, okay, that we are using it in our emergency. If you want to put an IV line, peripheral line, or you want to do lumbar puncture, you can apply it for like uh, almost, uh, you know, 30 to 60 uh, minutes before procedure, okay? Uh, and there is something called LET, which stands for lidocaine, epinephrine, and tetracaine. Also, this is like a solution. You put it in a cotton or ghost, and yes, just you apply it to the wound or you apply it to the back of the patient for lumbar puncture, and this will work as a local, uh, <clears throat> uh, local anesthesia and, and, and superficial, of course, laceration on the face or the skull. Okay. <clears throat> Also, there is another uh, local an uh, analgesic uh, agent that we can use, uh, uh, as you know, lidocaine and pubicaine, which is actually as an injection, uh, which is infiltrate the area, okay? Uh, the usually the maximum dose of lidocaine, it is very important to know the dosage because sometimes uh, there is an absorption to the systemic circulation and causing complications. So this is very important. Okay, lidocaine, there is uh, with epinephrine, without epinephrine, okay? And I think, I think this is a very important uh, for a vascular area, high vascular area to use uh, lidocaine with epinephrine, but in the uh, peripheral, like in fingers or ear loop, you shouldn't use epinephrine because of the risk of ischemia. Okay. Uh, bupivacaine is the same, okay, and we can use it, but you have to be careful with the uh, <clears throat> dosage. Now we will go to our patient, okay? If you remember that, ah, uh, it's clear. It's not clear now. Yes, okay, great. Now we will go to our scenario. Okay, if you have any patient coming to the emergency, six-year-old needs CT, for example, you have a patient who had a head injury, minor head injury, but your consultant or you decide to do CT brain, okay? This is painless procedure, okay? So what medication you should use? Midazolam, propofol, or etomidate, one of these three medication. Sometimes the midazolam will not work, Okay, but before using the medication, you have to prepare the child for the procedure. The problem, they are taking him on the bed, ship, send him to the radiology department, and he's scared, he doesn't know what, put him in the mother lab, let the mother talk to him, and put her in the wheelchair and push her to the radiology department. If you feel he's not, then give him medicine, because some children, they are very cooperative, like this six-year-old, if he's in North America or Europe, they wouldn't do a sedation for him because most of them, you know, they explain to them, they talk to them, they try to uh, make them يعني, feel uh, safe of being uh, going to, through the cylinder of the CT. So midazolam, propofol, etomidate can be used. We start usually with midazolam. If he didn't respond, then you can give propofol, but give the right dose under monitoring because most of our children, they go to the radiology department with monitoring. Okay, seven year old who needs wound suture for head laceration. You don't have to sedate him, okay? Just give him local. And this is more than enough. If he is very like autistic child, and you scare that he may move, or you can give him like a, a midazolam dose, just a sedative. 
But in the last case, which is six year old with radius and fracture, he needs low, uh, close reduction. I think this is painful, definitely painful procedure. So you have to use, and my choice most of the time, ask my resident or fellow to give ketamine, midazolam, or you can give, for example, propofol and <clears throat> uh, plus fentanyl. Okay, because propofol uh, on behalf of midazolam. So you give propofol plus fentanyl or ketamine plus midazolam or fentanyl plus midazolam. Okay, you have so many options. Okay, and this is good actually when you practice to give all these kind of medication to give you more experience in using this medication. I hope I'm not uh, taking more time. Right. So, uh, so for painless procedure, midazolam, propofol, etomidate, Okay, for minor pain procedure, local will be more than enough. For major pain, propofol, fentanyl, ketamine, midazolam, or fentanyl, midazolam. I hope this is clear. <clears throat> of course, before you start, you have to have an IV line. Okay, <clears throat> lumbar puncture, paronychia, digital block, foreign body removal. This is the, the, the indication usually for procedural sedation. Okay. But uh, no, I'm sorry. I think this is IV placement. This is just to give the local. This is for local, okay? Not the procedure sedation, only local. Okay, what is the pitfalls? What is the most common mistake that we usually do in our emergency? Okay, sometimes we are giving a wrong medication, asking the nurse, please give me 20. I will tell you a story. It happened to me when I was working in uh, National Guard. I asked the nurse to give 20 milligram of uh, ketamine and by mistake, she gave 200 milligram of ketamine, okay? Luckily, the child, he become like, he has some difficulty breathing. We manage by giving only ambu bag just for like one minute and back. So this made me feel like ketamine is very safe drug. That's why it's very popular. It's been used everywhere, but it doesn't mean that you should give 10 times the right dose, okay? Uh, <clears throat> using reversal agent to speed recovery. This is one of the common mistake. You shouldn't do this. Uh, not knowing when to refer to anesthesiologist. You, if you need help, you should call early for uh, anesthesia if you need airway secure or whatever. And... Uh, <clears throat> and failure to know what is the outcome of your sedation. This is a major problem because sometimes you are giving ketamine to older child, for example, 10 years, and he start hallucinating and start talking to his mother in a nonsense way. And they are asking you and you don't say, well, I don't know. I think we should consult psychiatry or we should. No, this is part of his side effect. So you should know everything about your medication that you are given, okay. So uh, in summary, you have to be selective. You have to know what cases they need procedure sedation and what type of procedural sedation you should give to these uh, kind of cases. Very important, patient, procedure, pharmacy, you should know your medication, drugs and everything. And personnel, RT, sometimes I need his help. Of course, the nurses should be there. One of the nurses should be recording. The other nurse should take care of the, given the medication or taking care of the airway or whatever, or helping you during the procedure. So you have to be prepared. Don't rush, okay? And if you feel everybody is there in the room and the medication is ready and everything is ready, and then you start giving the medication and you, you notice that there is no ambu bag, no airway devices, monitoring, not connected. Tell them, hold, don't do anything. Make sure to prepare yourself because you will be the one who is in charge and you will be the one who will be responsible for all, for anything as a complication happened to the child. Any question, please? Okay. So, so what age group do you prefer ketamine? To be honest with you, below the pediatric age group, you can feel safe. But above 10 years of age, as long as you have propofol, get propofol. 
it's better, okay? But the younger age group, there is no harm, you can go. Uh, what certificate should ER physician take to do sedation procedure? Actually, there is a course called uh, procedure sedation course. And uh, in our hospital, I think it is only for the physician or in, 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 in King Faisal. Each hospital, they have like, you know, a certificate and they have like a assignment. But it, it's been done by the anesthesia, unfortunately. Okay, it should be done by our ER physician. <laughs> in North America, ER physician, they are the one who certified people for procedural sedation, to be honest with you. And ER physician, even in Canada, they, they, they don't have, in North America, uh, but I'm sure in Canada, they don't have to uh, do uh, procedure sedation, especially if they are doing it uh, like on a daily basis. Okay, other questions? Do you have any other questions? There is no more questions. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me see the answer here. Okay. Uh -huh. I would like to ask about combination between ketamine and propofol. No, it cannot be. Thanks a lot. Okay. Sabri, Maryam, no, you cannot give both propofol and ketamine. They are the same group. It cannot be. Either ketamine midazolam or propofol alone plus midazolam or propofol plus fentanyl. Okay? Good. Uh, clear, uh, Maryam? Then uh, can we use... Uh, uh, dioxide. I don't know what do you mean by dioxide drone for CT. I didn't understand how many accepted does it mm -hmm. for CT. By the way, most of the time, by most of the time, you know, before even sedation, prepare your child, talk to your child, tell him, I'm gonna take you to do a picture. We will take just only a picture of you, okay? Appreciate, and we have to. What is the maximum dose of ketamine? Okay, this is a very good question. Well, to be honest with you, yeah, Abrar, I don't know exactly, but uh, you can go up to 50 milligram in, in, in children. We don't go more than 50 milligram, okay? Uh, if foreign body in hand, small, what about? Restrain for like two years with local. Mm -hmm. well, you know, uh, now uh, uh, the, 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 the WHO consider pain in children and removing pain or relieving pain from children is their right. It is the, the patient right. So I think it is very important to try your best not to restrain if, it, if you feel like it won't take that more like uh, 10 seconds to remove it, that's fair enough. But uh, still, you should give something to relieve pain from children. Age group for chloral hydrate. Chloral hydrate, we don't recommend it anymore. It is below six years of age because for those who are not cooperative, children who are cooperative, they don't need any sedation. Is restraint forbidden? <laughs> it's not, but uh, still, you know, we have to try all options, but still, sometimes we are forced to do restraint. We have no choice, okay? We have no option, other option, but to restrain. Uh, this is, an, okay? الآن, and I have to look at the schedule to see if we can... Uh, <clears throat> do the break. إحنا ما أخذنا بريك صح ولا لا؟ الآن الساعة uh, almost 11 <تصفيق> أوه والله طيب إيوه بس إن أخذنا المحاضرة صحيح الآن المفروض يبدأ الدكتور الماضي بعد عشر دقائق يعني الساعة 11 و10 راح نبدأ Is it okay with you guys? Please 10 و 10 عفوا 11 محمد ليش ما نبدأ دكتور عشان قبل الصلاة نخلص
ما في مشكلة it's up to you guys إذا كان أنت جاهز وهم جاهزين أنا أمري دي يلا طيب لا لا تطلعوا الأخ الدكتور شليويح لا تطلع خليكم قاعدين راح وي ويل كونتينيو اوكي علشان البراير تايم لازم نشوف و... واثناء البراير بناخذها كبريك وك شو اسمه آه... وبراير بريك اولسو يلا بالتوفيق <تصفيق> اور نيكست سبيكر از دكتور حمد الماضي حمد الماضي اي ثينك موست اوف يو نو هيم هي از ان اسيستنت بروفيسور ات الفيصل يونيفرستي كولج اوف ميديسن هي از بيدياتريك ايمرجنسي كونسلتنت at uh, uh, Prince Sultan uh, Military Medical uh, City. And uh, he's a pediatric emergency uh, consultant there, yes. And he uh, also certified um, an ultrasound <coughs> uh, instructor. And uh, he will talk about uh, uh, ultrasound fast and rush. It will be two parts. So Dr. Hamad, you can start, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed, uh, and also thank you for this is, um, invitation. Um, I will cover in today uh, two important um, approach in the emergency department. Uh, I will start in uh, the first technique. I have to be familiar for anyone working in the emergency department. Uh, um, you have to be familiar and have this skill for using ultrasound for EFAST. And uh, uh, the second the topic will be covered the rush protocol uh, using in the patient in shock, how to differentiate between the different type of shock and how to utilize this is, uh, uh, technique for uh, the, um, this is uh, using this technique in the, the emergency department. Uh, uh, fast before he's familiar for uh, the surgeon about the fast before it changed to be fast that's a focused uh, assessment with the sonography in the trauma that will be just focusing on uh, uh, protonial space and uh, bricardial space for any uh, fluid or bleeding. And then after that change to be uh, extend fast. So we'll be included uh, hemothorax and pneumothorax with the, this technique. So we will recover the hemothorax, the pneumothorax, and the proteinal space and recover the space if there is any bleeding. Uh, this is case scenario. This is present to the uh, emergency department after um, um, trauma or uh, motor vehicle accident. This 10 years old male uh, presented with uh, by AMS and the patient uh, kept on the C collar and uh, backboard. A uh, patient uh, for airway is awake, uh, awake and agitated patient uh, maintain the airway. Um, patient equal air entry bilateral, but the oxygen saturation is 85 and the respiratory rate is around 30. And patient from the C is called extremities and blood pressure is 85 over 50 and the heart rate is around 140. No external source of bleeding, and patient is um, with contusion to the left upper abdomen. So, what's the next step for this patient? What you have to do? This patient present uh, with injury, and we have big differential diagnosis. We have uh, maybe this intraabdominal or pleural or pericardial or pneumothorax or cardiogenic or neurogenic. I didn't know what's going on with this patient. So it's very important to have some tool to be help you, to guide you what you have to do and what, uh, how to direct uh, your management. So uh, we have uh, different approach. If we go for physical examination, you will have patient is uh, almost um, low sensitivity because the patient already is distracted by the injury and maybe this patient unconscious or the decreased level of consciousness. So maybe he's not very helpful to differentiate it. Uh, all technique, this DBL or the, um, uh, for this is patient protein uh, lafage, diagnostic protein lafage. This one is used before and to be helped to find if there is any intraabdominal bleeding or not, but now no longer used uh, and, uh, today. So it's not very helpful. So CT scan, patient is not uh, uh, fit to go to the uh, emergency department, to the CT scan department. So he's not stable enough to go there. So what you have to do? We have ultrasound. This is that um, uh, our talk today. 
we are very accurate and portable and non-invasive and no radiation for this one. But it's also there is some pitfalls and limitation. Um, sometimes we're feeling some difficulty to differentiate the type of fluid. Maybe this patient has ascites, or maybe it's not bleeding. Um, um, and also specificity is not like uh, CT scan. And also depend on the operator uh, and how's the skills of the operator. And um, uh, sometimes it's difficult to detect the retroperitoneal uh, injury. Um, our goal for this is ultrasound and using the fast to find free fluid in the space of the proteinal, uh, pleural, uh, pericardial space, and looking for it, it, the patient present with pneumothorax secondary to this trauma. Ultrasound or fast is useful uh, also for other, other uh, non-traumatic cases and very helpful for patients present with uh, sepsis or rupture uh, ectopic pregnancy or ovarian cyst or different presentation or scenario. We're not focused just only in the, the, the trauma cases. So what we have to do, we we'll start for uh, the right upper quadrant. So we'll keep the uh, carefully near probe in the uh, lower costal margin in the um, in the between the anterior and the uh, posterior axillary line, and will be uh, fanning. If this is the probe to find if if, if we can uh, find any free, free fluid for this patient. And then after that, we'll go to lift upper quadrant. Uh, if you um, find any fluid or any any problem with this patient. Then uh, after that, we'll go subzephoid, uh, sorry, um, uh, suprabubic. Um, suprabubic, after that, will you go to a few um, sagittal and uh, uh, transfers. Then subzephoid for this patient will be to rule out any bleeding of uh, uh, precarter fluid or bleeding. Uh, then after that, we'll go to find any any uh, flu uh, pneumothorax and also to rule our uh, if there is any intrathoracic bleeding. So we, we, we have to arrange yourself and you spend not more time with the going with this is uh, uh, cases, um, not exceeding more than two minutes. Uh, so you have to organize yourself, right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, subject for a uh, suprabubic subzephoid, and then the chest. Um, chest is very important to buy linear, change the probe from um, uh, carefully to linear, and to be focused on the, uh, if there is any good sliding or not. We'll start. Technique. Right upper quadrant, we'll put the patient between the mid axillary line at the level of the subzephoid process, and the probe marker toward the head. You have to fan toward and backward to be to be clear to see the um, morsum pouch. So we have to be visualize the kidney and just to fan to find the kidney and morsum pouch, and to be easy to detect any any fluid or not. Now you can see morsum pouch in this area between the liver and the kidney, and this is the spine. So this is the diaphragm. So we will try to find any fluid between the spleen, uh, sorry, between the liver and the kidney, okay? Don't forget to visualize the lower bone or inferior bone of the uh, kidney. Sometimes the fluid will be just positive in this area. So <clears throat> we'll be focused in all the area of that morsum pouch will be not forget also the inferior bowl of the kidney and also the upper part of the kidney between the liver and the hepatic and the renal. And also, you will not forget also this is between the liver and the diaphragm. So it's very important to find if there is any fluid or not, or bleeding, sorry. So like this one, you is negative. You can't see any, if there is any fluid or a blood, would be looks like black. Okay, 
So like this case, you didn't find anything. So it's normal. But when you see this, this uh, clip and compare to the uh, left side, we'll find there is black rim between the hepatic and the liver, uh, uh, renal. So the Borson bar is positive like this. So this normal, this positive free fluid. Now, this patient present after stab by a wound to the chest, right chest, and you will find some collection and black area in the Morrison pouch. So it's positive like this. So positive free fluid for this patient. You go to the other different scenario. This patient fall from two days ago, and the blood positive also the free parts. Sometimes we feel some difficulty because the blood will be changed from the echogenicity from um, an echo to be um, um, changed to be uh, increase the echogenicity to be hyper echo. So sometimes difficult to be uh, to, 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 to differentiate it from the uh, other tissue. So how to be uh, avoid the rib shadow? Can sometimes to block the view. So we have to rotate the probe clockwise and to try to find uh, fan, uh, the probe forward and backward, we visualize the, the area. Usually keep the probe rotated and tilting uh, 10 degree to the, toward the bit. Sometimes you can be confused with the gallbladder and renal cyst, and sometimes an IVC. So how can differentiate it from the fluid? You can see the wall of the gallbladder and will be, can be easy to be differentiated from the gallbladder from uh, the free fluid for this patient. So uh, benefric fat sometimes can be mimic the uh, hematoma. So we have to compare it to the other side. Don't forget, take this message. This is the free fluid for this patient. This is the gallbladder, and this is the clot, and this is, this is difficult of free fat for this one or this one. Um, and uh, in the uh, short fascia will be sometimes can mimic that uh, fluid. Uh, we have uh, now slide the probe upwards after finishing from that the abdomen to look for any fluid in the pleuralysis above the diaphragm to find if the spine sign will be continue above the diaphragm, that's positive. Normal spine stop at the level of the diaphragm. Pleural fluid and spinous continue above the diaphragm, that's meaning there is something of fluid can be the uh, lit, this is the beam of the sound can be visualized above the diaphragm. This is the diaphragm, this is the spine. If you can see the spine continue above this one, that's the spine sign is positive for this patient. That's meaning there is patient with the bleeding in the thoracic area. This is normal for this patient. But this also this is normal. You can see that the spine will stop in the level of the diaphragm, but when you compare this other slide, you can see the spine continue above the diaphragm, so it's positive for this patient. Let's see this other one. You can see this is the spine. Okay, this is the diaphragm, and this is the kidney. So positive free fluid is very important and you have to be clear and visualized. Lift after upper quadrant is very important to be uh, considered is more posterior and more superior than our right upper quadrant. A probe marker toward the head, same as the right side. Uh, you have to be fan forward and backward to be visualized the kidney and see that uh, spilinorenal uh, uh, area. So this is the spleen. You can see the spleen and you can see the kidney and you can see the spine and diaphragm. You have to looking for uh, above that spleen 
between the spleen and the, the diaphragm and between the spleenorenal to, to be sure there is no any uh, uh, collection of bleeding. Usually, uh, the, the uh, Morrison pouch on right side is around 85. If it's positive, most likely of the cases will be positive. So uh, most of the fluid is connected or the area, three area, the, the uh, spinal uh, renal and uh, hepatic renal and uh, pelvic area is connected by gutter. So it can, any fluid with, and one area can be transmitted to move to the other area. Okay, most of the fluid do around 85 in the Morrison pouch. In the small age or small pediatric age, usually in the pelvic area or pelvic area, the sensitivity. Sometimes you can position, reposition of the patient, tell them bear position to be to feel of to increase the sensitivity of the ultrasound. You can see in this image. And comparing the image number one from two, you can see like rim or fluid or uh, bleeding between the spleen and the diaphragm. Right. Uh, also, you can see anything? Yes, you can see some fluid or bleeding. So it's, it's positive for this patient. You can see and you compare the, the first clip from the second clip, okay? Uh, it's very important to, to visualize this one and see if there is any fluid in the pleural or not. You will slide the probe up to, to the side of the thoracic, same what you did in the, in the right side. You can see the spine is continue and is above the diaphragm, so it's positive. And this one, it was this one stop in the level of the diaphragm, so is negative. So we have to rotate the probe clockwise to, to avoid any rib shadow. Look for the superior and lateral for the spatial uh, to for uh, to, to the spleen uh, <coughs> between the spleen and left kidney to rule out any any problem for this patient. After finishing from the left and uh, right side, we go suprapubic. Suprapubic is in the pelvis area. It's very important to keep the probe direct to the to the head. Obtain both transfer and longitudinal view. Don't forget, probe marker to the head, longitudinal uh, to the right side, transfer position. Free fluid usually between in the male between the urinary bladder. Uh, behind the urinary bladder and the rectum, a female in the Douglas pouch or behind the, uh, the uterus. So this is transfer position, you can see, and this is the, the, the other one, the right one is longitudinal, we can keep the probe in the direct to the head. So we have to be very familiar when we have to see the fluid, we would really more posterior to the urinary bladder. So now you can see <clears throat> this is the transfer position and this is the sagittal, sagittal directed to the head. Now you can see black area and this is the urinary bladder. You can see this is the sagittal and it will be posterior for this is uh, urinary bladder. This is positive. Also there is positive. And transfers, you can see this is the urine bladder and this is the black is more posterior for the bladder. So this one transfers and long signal. And also there is other lady for this one, this present um, 18 years old with the missed uh, period. And we find that ectopic pregnancy, we find a lot of blood and uh, bleeding and clots for this one and hypotensive this patient. Also, there is free fluid for this one and the transfer position, same patient. So it's very important as well to be non and uh, for non-traumatic case, it, it's, it, it's better to be performed with the full urinary bladder to be clear to visualize the posterior and keep that bladder as like acoustic uh, 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 organ for you to guide you to visualize the posterior part uh, related to the bladder. 
After finishing this one, you go to sub point for this patient. You can keep the probe and um, the marker it will be the same direction of the probe uh, uh, marker on the screen. If it's right, right, if it's left, left. And you keep the probe is more flat. You can just um, um, rotate, uh, just tilt in your hand to the right side to, to toward the, the, the patient's right to keep the, 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 the probe is near to the liver to be uh, as a QST Kundi for you. You have to flatten the probe to be clear for you to visualize this one. More flat for this one. You can visualize this one, it's very easy. You can see the heart part is the left side, it is the right side. If there is any fluid usually of this bleeding and the bricardia will be starting from the posterior, then it will go to the apex and then complete the heart. So it's very important. And also sometimes some doctors prefer to go for different uh, uh, few to uh, for lung access uh, to be help a few to be sure if there is a, flu if a fluid and to confirm if there is fluid or not. So sometimes it's very, very difficult to um, see some uh, bricardia fusion of, uh, without seeing this posterior. So we have to be sure to increase the depth to be not mistaken this one or not mistaken by boost, uh, the fat pad. Um, also, sometimes com can be confused with the bleeding with the uh, broad fusion or uh, hemothoracic. So it's very important to see that the aorta is anterior this uh, fluid or bricardia fusion. Like this one, you see that the cynic aorta, this is the fluid is posterior. So it's uh, going with the pleura then to go for the bricardia fusion. Sometimes you can see like this one, you can see the bricardia and you can see it also in the, uh, the pleura. So to improve the image of quality, you increase the depth, slide the probe uh, more to the right, ask the patient to inhale, to, to, to push the heart to, to, the, to the abdominal area. Uh, you can make bending, or bend the, the knee to, to, to help to uh, make pressure to increase the quality of the image for this one and create the fluid. Um, small um, hemobricardium can be uh, called a tumbinand, a bricardial fat maybe can be confused with a bricardial fluid. You can see this is the fat pad also, don't confuse with this one, and also this other memory. Usually the fluid started in the, in the posterior. Also the pneumothorax, you can keep the, the probe with the linear probe in the uh, mid clavicular I mean, below the mid, uh, mid clavicular line and you start perpendicular, keep the probe perpendicular and you can see the direction of the probe to be direct to the head. So um, to be easy, this is the subtenous tissue and the muscle. And see the comma tail for this one is comma tail have to be moving uh, forward and backwards to be sure there's good sliding for this one. So we have to focus in the comma tail for this one. You can see no any movement, no sliding. Okay. So uh, if you cannot see the comma tail, also this, this one, if there's no comma tail, usually this is no no motor uh, coma tail is present, this meaning patient is called, there is a good slide for this one. So it's very important to be sure there's good sliding, there is coma tail, to be sure this patient is, uh, there is good motor or not. And also don't forget to look for, where is the lung point? Lung point is starting point between the normal to abnormal finding, okay? So this comma tail, you can see the sliding, but it's stop in this lipid. So there is no sliding in this area. So in summary, there is, if there is any free fluid in the uh, hepatorenal um, interface, uh, you have to looking for a caudal tip of the liver 
between the liver and the diaphragm, don't forget, inferior pool of the kidney, pleural space. Also, uh, in the left side, the uh, superior and lateral to spleen, spleenorenal interface with this one and pleural space. Uh, in the suprapubic, you have to main behind the urinary bladder, if uh, we are talking about the male behind the uterus. Um, and then uh, some fault for fluid in the pericardial space. Then go to the pneumothorax to sign if there is a pneumothorax lack of the lung sliding or lack of the promotial uh, artifact. We'll go back to my our case scenario. This our case scenario. Um, we did uh, for this patient all the few. We can see there is no any right side, left side, no any movement. There is no coma tail, no any sliding, and also there is free fluid between the spleen uh, and the uh, renal. So it's positive in the left side with the, uh, there is pneumothorax. So what you're finding, this is the finding. This patient, is, as just to, to, to remind you, this is 10 years old male. This present with the blood pressure 85 over 50, heart rate 140, oxygen, uh, patient oxygen and IV fluid. Uh, uh, given for this uh, normal saline. Um, um, two uh, back to RBC given for this patient, ultrasound found that is the left pneumothorax with free fluid in the left upper quadrant. So just two done for this patient and blood pressure stroke heart rate is 150. So this patient transferred directly to the OR. So uh, it's very important to be familiar for this uh, fast and to be uh, have this skill is very important and uh, it's very important to be um, um, uh, to practice yourself for any patient present with post trauma or major trauma also you can use for sepsis for this patient as will be see or discuss in the rush protocol uh, we can move to the second part then we can uh, open the flow for the any questions for uh, past and rush protocol. Uh, next talk for me will be um, will be about how to utilize the ultrasound in the patient present in the AR with the uh, with the shock how to use, uh, how to utilize the ultrasound. So rush protocol is, is the abbreviation of the rapid ultrasound in shock patient. So um, this, uh, inter, uh, um, isn't, this is approach, the will see this patient first. This patient is um, 10 years old also. Uh, presented with the chief complaint, which is chest pain and the uh, shortness of the feet, five days uh, with history of cold and cough symptoms. There was uh, a recurrence of the febrile episode and epigastric pain. Uh, on a physical examination, uh, this heart rate is around 110, uh, respiratory rate around 30, blood pressure is 85 over 65, and temperature 38.5. Oxygen saturation is around uh, 90 in room air. What do you have to do for this patient? This common scenario you can see in any uh, department, any emergency department. So it's very difficult sometimes to, to make good di uh, differentiation between these different type of shock. We need to know we have, we are managing um, uh, cardiac, managing uh, uh, respiratory or managing sepsis. So according to the, to the, the differential will be managed and uh, you can uh, tailor your uh, the approach according to that uh, uh, your finding. So maybe it's cardiogenic, or bricardial fusion, hypovolemic shock, or basic pneumothorax, or maybe aortic dissection, or a new pneumonia, or pleural fusion, uh, or hemorrhage. So it's, so it's a very big list for you. So what you have to do for this patient? So we need something to, to help you to make a good general management measure and specific treatment measure for this patient. So we'll utilize the ultrasound. Ultrasound is very important for guiding the therapy for IV fluid, bolus, and vasopressors. 
and also for specific treatment for a diagnosis for this one, like with this patient because it's due to cardiac synthesis or chest tube or uh, OR or uh, started patient in antibiotic. So it's very important to, to familiar for what's the rush. Rush protocol is, is putting everything together. Why? You are, this is rush protocol presented by the uh, Philips is uh, an uh, adult uh, patient is uh, best pop, uh, introduced for that uh, adult is 2010. Uh, and we are utilizing this is approach in, in our uh, patient and pediatric and very helpful. There is a lot of study done for the pediatric age and found this approach very helpful and to manage many cases and to guide you to, to, to manage what's the good approach for this patient. Uh, uh, as you know, that's a shock usually as pump problem or in the tank or in the pipe. So as in pump, like in cardiac problem or an IPC or in tank, you usually find the lung or abdomen, any bleeding or any source of that uh, losing of, uh, of the fluid or losing of, um, um, of, um, of the, there is any ble interabdominal bleeding. Uh, what about pipe? Uh, sometimes more common in the adult, but it can be applied this one in uh, pediatric to looking for uh, our top from starting from the heart to the, uh, to, the, to, the uh, to the thoracic and to go to the abdomen. Then last one, the, the, the DVT to roll out DVT and to roll out any pulmonary embolism for this patient. So for, from this uh, differential from tank and pump and pipes, it can, can be a distributive shock or cardiogenic shock or obstructive shock or hypovolemic shock. So what's the protocol? Let's start. Our protocol will be focused in cardiac to answer some questions about this one. What the few will be see? We'll see different few. That um, few will be parasthenia long axis, parasthenia short axis, and uh, apical four chambers and IVC to look for any any change in the liver uh, left ventricle uh, function or any RF strain or bricardia free fluid. What about the and IVC? What about the lung? Would we'll be going to, to answer three important questions. There is any good lung sliding, B line, uh, pleural free fluid. So it's very important. What about abdomen? Abdomen same what he did in the past. What he did in the past same will be do in the abdomen. Will you see that's protein free fluid? See there is any positive past for this one. Our transfer. I have to have to make good uh, sweeping for that uh, transducer to roll out any hour to change in the measurement uh, more than three centimeter or there any dissection. DVT, uh, you have to looking for femoral vein, uh, popliteal vein to roll out uh, if there is any thrombus. Uh, Let's start one by one. We'll start uh, our vertical in the cardiac, we'll see. We'll start um, parasthenia for this one, long axis for this patient. We'll have a uh, few. The few will be uh, left atrium. This is the left ventricle and will be the right ventricles. So what you have to looking for, what's the question you have to be answered? Uh, I mentioned for this one, how is the left ventricle function? There is any RF strain, any free uh, fluid. Okay. So if uh, the left ventricle uh, global contractility is good, you have to make a good distance between the matter path, how is moving the matter path for this patient and is hitting of the septum or and posterior wall or not. And also, if there is uh, any change in the uh, interpretive septum, there is how is contractility of this one, how is the squeezing of the heart. Then also, you can make a ratio between the uh, RV and the aorta and left atrium to be sure this is the ratio is no change. Almost all the three area will be the uh, equal. 
Uh, what about uh, bricardia fusion or bricardia free fluid? You have to look for any fluid in the bricardial space. So you have to search for any free, free fluid and to be sure no any accumulation of the fluid for this patient. But after that, squeezing heart nicely, no any problem. Okay. But about this one, you can see. No. Let's see, start. I'm sorry. So, how is this? Is 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 not squeezing well, and the valve is not moving at all. So is, is the ejection fraction for this patient is low compared to the uh, left one. You can compare this one and the right one. You can see how is that septum is hitting of the posterior wall. This one going with the kissing sign for this patient. This very very high ejection fraction for this patient. You can see here, it's normal, but you can see also the right side compared to the left side and make good measurement to compare both the, the uh, right ventricle with the aorta and the left atrium. You can see this one almost equal, but when you compare this, the, 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 the clip at this side, you can see the uh, right ventricle is a little bit more enlarged comparing to the aorta and left atria. And pushing of the septum to the left side. So it's going with the RV strain for this patient. Now, after that, you can see if there is any fusion. There's no fusion, but in this, in this uh, clip, you can see black surrounding the heart. So it's going with the, there is a fusion for this patient. Okay, so this is normal patient, but this low ejection fraction, this RP strain, you can see the right side is very large, and also blow a fusion, there is clear fusion. So after finishing from that um, parastinal log axis, you can go to the short axis. You will rotate the probe or direct the probe to the right hip. So make a cross section for the heart. So shortcut for the heart. Okay. You can see the circle like this one, this is left ventricle and Is, uh, is, uh, will be beside the left screen for the, the, the valve. You can see it's pushing, but in this image, you can see this pushing the right side. This is if we increase the uh, pressure in the left side, right side, would be this is the right ventricle, will be pushing the septum, and you can give the D sign for this one or R. This one called this one is uh, arc strain. Now you roll out any how is the contractility? How is that bricard diffusion? There is any bricard diffusion, and also there is increase in the size of right ventricle or arc strain. Now, now we are familiar now for that uh, size, if it is increased or not. Uh, you can see the low ejection fraction. Also, uh, you can see also the RP strain and pushing of the heart, uh, and also bricardia free fluid surrounding the heart. After finishing from that uh, uh, parasitic long axis and shortening axis, you can go a bicard four chamber. 
you can see the heart all the four chambers and you can see you can ask yourself about three important questions how is the contractility there is any free, free fluid or any uh, because the fusion and also and the size of the right side is is uh, it have to be not uh, more uh, than 0.6 of the left side or it is equal or more than the left side to ensure that this patient please the uh, right side or RP straight. Now, you can see how the heart is, is squeezing, it's nice. But now when you compare this one with the patient with no you can see is flickering. It's almost this room animal for this patient. Also, you can see the right side is in love compared to the left side, but this one you can see almost equal. Or, sorry, um, the right side uh, less than the left side. Also, if you find any fluid or the precardial fluid for this one, to be sure there is any fluid for this one. After that, you answer these questions. You can be sure about ejection fraction, if there is any RP strain for this patient, or if there is any pericardial uh, free fluid. Then after that, you can go for evaluation of the volume for this patient. If it is uh, volumic or volume is overloaded or volume depleted for this patient. How to can measure this one by going by IVC and direct approach to that direct to the head to be sure there is any problem or not. Now you can see the liver and you see the IVC is uh, to be um, uh, going to the right side or right uh, atrium. You can see this one and you can make good assessment for this one. How is collapsibility? If it's collapse, complete collapse or change with the inhalation escalation. And also, uh, if it's normal or not, is depleted or missing for this one, collapse, or is it very fixed, dilated, is not changed with this one. You can see this volume here. It's overloaded. You can see this image. This one is not changing with the with the with the breathing for this patient. But when you go, compare it to the side, almost kissing or collapse with the breathing for this patient. So this patient, no need fluid, this most likely there is problems overloaded, but this one is depleted and need more fluid for this patient. After from the from finish from cardiac, we go for lung. What you have to do to answer in the lung, you can see if there is any neurofusion. Okay, sorry, sliding or pneumothorax. If the patient, there is comatid artifact, and also there is good sliding forward and backward, sure or not. You can see this is uh, sliding, good sliding for this patient. And you can compare this one with the, there is no any movement for this patient. And also you can see the P-line, if the patient is congested lung or not, to be sure there is P-line or not. And also you can find in the, Spine sign is positive or negative for the patient right and left side. We can see the diaphragm stop that the spine is not. Uh, yeah, you can see this image. The spine is now extended above the, the diaphragm, so it's very clear for you. It's positive. The other one is negative for the patient. Uh, after finishing from the lung, you can go to the abdomen. What you have to do with the abdomen, we'll do same what he did in the right and the left, and then a subrobiotic. Right side, you can see if there is any fluid in the Morrison pouch, it's same what he did before. And also if it is positive and clear for you, or then after that you go to the left side, we show if there is any fluid in the left side or not, then go. This you can, can see this uh, this is the rim of this uh, fluid in the in the, the above the spleen it's very clear for you. After that, you can see uh, the subrobiotic of the, the bladder is uh, 
in the, the transverse and sagittal to be sure there is a fluid. If you are speaking about male, it would be posterior to the, the, to the inner bladder. If you are speaking about female, it would be as posterior to the uterus. You can see this is a typical pregnancy for this lady, and there is fluid around everywhere. Also, you can see uh, this is normal. We can see any uh, black area or any fluid in the uh, in the blood, uh, posterior to the uh, urinary bladder. After finishing from the abdomen, you can go to the aorta. What you have to do in the aorta, you will do to roll out. You will start in the subsifoid transfer position, and you can sweep that that the, the transducer to the umbilicus. So what you have to look for, you can look for what? You can see the spine and you can see the aorta. Till the bifurcation. You can just start it from the, uh, uh, from the subsifoid at the level of the superior mesenteric artery, then go down to the bifurcation to be sure there is no, no change in the measurement or any dis dissection or thrombus. So we can make measurement anterior posterior to be, if you are measuring the common iliac, you can, if you are measuring the aorta, you have to be not exceed more than three centimeters. If we are measuring the uh, common iliac artery, you have to be not exceed more than 1.5 centimeter for this patient. Okay. Sometimes you can make a um, uh, long axis, but usually it depends on more and the shorter axis for measurement than to go for the long axis. Now we can see that's the normal one, but when you compare this one, is uh, there is clear thrombus and clear that's that's our so you can see from outer wall to outer wall to be sure it is not increased in the size. Also, you can to be sure there is no any flap for this patient. DVT to be sure there is any, uh, uh, it will be usually if you are speaking about uh, DVT, you are focused in the femoral area and popliteal area. So we'll start from the uh, near to the great saphenous, uh, our starting of the femoral uh, area, the fin, and we'll go uh, sliding probe down till the uh, bifurcation of the bifurcation of the femoral pain. Usually the artery, the bifurcation of the femoral uh, artery is will be uh, the, uh, more proximal than in the femoral pain. So we will start from the um, femoral at the level of the great stephanus, then we'll go down to uh, sliding this one to distally to the bifurcation of the femoral pain. When you're sure about compressibility uh, for, uh, from starting this point till the, this point, you are sure for about this point, you can go to move to the bubblitia, bubblitia posterior to the knee or bubblitia area, and uh, bubblitia fossa, you can just searching for uh, uh, compressibility of that bubblitia and till the bifurcation, trifurcation for this pain. So you can see this is the great surfness and this is femoral uh, pain. You can make good pressure to be sure there is uh, collapsibility is good or not. Sure, you see, you have to make good pressure for this one to be sure there is no any thrombus. Sometimes don't depend on that echogenicity. Sometimes thrombus is maybe is uh, an echo. So don't even like this one. You have to be sure in that uh, pain is co collapse or uh, collapsibility or compressible or not. You can compare this one and compressible pain. You can see you make good pressure, but this is not compressible. This one. This is the uh, this is the bifurcation of the femoral artery. You can see this superficial more deep. Now you can go after that to, to bubblitia 
you can see the vein is large one and more superficial. You can see the artery is make good pressure till the, you can see that this showing is compressible or not kind of compressible. And, but you can see in this case, we make good pressure, but still there is a problem. There is the vein cannot be compressed or non compressible uh, for, for that uh, high pressure for this patient. Now we finish from this cardiac, lung, abdomen, and aorta, and uh, through our DPT. Now we can go to case scenario for this patient. What case scenario you can do? Case number one. This patient uh, present 10 years old, uh, present with the chest pain, same hour case case, and heart rate 120, blood pressure 85, over 65, uh, oxygen saturation 90, and the respiratory rate, as you see, this one 33. So when you make rush exam for this patient, we'll do cardiac and IVC abdomen for this patient, and also lung and aorta and through out any DPT. You will do, um, periscardic, you can see there is fluid around this one and show there is any fluid closing the heart. Then, so this uh, hypo, uh, hyper uh, dynamic, no RV strain, there is a pericardia fluid, free fluid. But when you go to the IPC, you can see fixed dilated for this one. Okay. When you go to What do you think? This is hyperdynamic and very cardiac fluid and fixed dilated. What do you think about this one? For this patient. So this patient needs to go for, for directly for bricardic uh, synthesis for this patient. So to make clear, um, raise that pressure around that heart, around the heart. Case number two, this patient presented uh, two years, uh, history of vomiting and uh, loose motion and uh, loose of uh, appetite, this heart rate 160, blood pressure 70 over 40, blood oxygen saturation 89 and raw air. We did for this patient cardiac and IVC, abdomen, lung, aorta, and DVT for this patient. Uh, cardiac for this patient, we did, we did this patient. For this patient, he did this cardiac, you can see. It's more contractility for this one. And it's, 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 it's almost only flickering of that part. So decrease the ejection function. When you go to, for the IPC, you can see, fixed dilated. Abdomen, normal, no free fluid, lung, for this patient, good sliding, our normal measurement, and also about uh, there is no dissection. DVT, compressible, so it looks normal. For this patient, you go with decreased injection fraction and dilated, it's going with the cardiogenic shock. The, uh, case number three is four month old. Uh, baby uh, uh, boy present with his performance before feeding. We uh, did a heart rate for this patient's uh, tachycardic 170, blood pressure 70 over 40, uh, oxygen station 93 in the raw air. We uh, did rush protocol exam for this patient. Cardiac, you can see. Hyperdynamic for this one, kissing sign for this one. It's decreased the, the chamber size for this one. So it decreases the fluid, okay? Uh, but also when you go to the IPC, almost kissing this one, 
there is no fluid depleted of the fluid. Abdomen normal, lung. It's good sliding. About our stuff is normal size and there is no dissection. What about the uh, DPT? No DPT for this one is compressible. So it's going with the hypovolemic shock for this patient. So it's very important to remember this is uh, uh, how to, to, to approach this patient with the, in the shock. It's very important familiar for this one. You have to be some questions you have to be answered. If you are looking for cardiac parasitic lung access, parasitic uh, short access, and epica for chamber IPC, to looking for any change in the liver, uh, lift ventricular function, or RP strain, or very cardiac fluid, looking for that depleted fluid in the IPC or grease or fixed then you go for lung for any good uh, lung sliding, B line, blur of free fluid. Then go for past to rule out any uh, uh, proteinial uh, fluid or uh, um, uh, there is any can can explain for this one usually using for patient uh, and then uh, trauma or patient present at the pregnancy or a different scenario for this patient. Um, uh, aorta to rule out any change in the measurement in the aorta more than three centimeter. Uh, there is any dissection of thrombus. DBT for this patient to rule out. Any, um, this patient is a non compressible non compressible pain in the femoral area or bobliteal pain. So uh, I will open uh, the floor for any question for uh, rush or fast. Any question? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hamad, uh, for this interesting uh, introduction to uh, FAST and RUSH. And uh, this is the first part, or this is uh, you already joined two parts together? I, I, I make it together, yeah. I finished for the past, I finished the past, and then I started in the rush, finished the rush, and they passed. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. So if you have any question, Dr. Hamad will be more than happy to answer. Uh, and uh, we have one more question. If you have any question, Dr. Hamad will be more than happy to answer. Before we go to our uh, break and uh, for uh, lunch and for also a prayer. And then we will come back uh, at uh, one o'clock better so we can uh, be with the uh, doctor uh, with uh, Hassan Al Hababa. So I think most of them, they are happy with your presentation. They are. Very grateful and thankful to you, uh, Dr. Hamad. Thank Excellent you. Uh, lecture. Uh, thanks uh, very much. Thank you, Dr. Hamad. Thank you. Uh, well, inshallah, we'll see you uh, tomorrow. We will start at one o'clock. I'm talking to Dr. Hamad tomorrow for his uh, next presentation will be tomorrow. Uh, Doctor, uh, uh, our uh, nursing instructor, Hassan Al-Hababa, will be with you at one o'clock. So be there, please. We'll try to finish it within uh, like uh, two hours so you can finish. And as I mentioned before, you have to attend 70% of the lectures. So you are eligible to get the hours uh, of our uh, course. Okay, Yalla, good luck. We will meet again at uh, one o'clock. Thank you very much. Salaam Alaikum. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. راح نبدأ إن شاء الله الآن ذا أفترنون سيشن. طبعاً أور نيكست سبيكر حسين الهبابة. هي إز كلينيكال إنستراكتور أت كينج فيصل سبيشالست هوسبيتال أند ريسيرش سنتر. هي إز فيري إكسبيرت إن نيرسينج إديوكيشن. Uh, <clears throat> Hussein will talk about uh, very important topics. He will try to cover these uh, two topics uh, in the next two, three hours. It depends on your uh, 
uh, cooperation and your uh, presence with him. Inshallah, we'll finish on time, before time even. Uh, he will talk first about triage in emergency medical services, part one and part two, and then he will go to pediatric sepsis campaign. This is a very important topic, and he will give you a highlight uh, from, the, um, from the nursing and physician point of view. Uh, I think uh, this is very important, and uh, you should uh, <clears throat> uh, put more attention to him, because this is one of the important presentation that uh, Hussein will give. Uh, Regarding uh, so many people, they are asking questions. Uh, do we have to register? Do we have to uh, put my name? No need to register, please. Yani Bar Adrin, Dr. Bar'a, just now she entered and she put her name. You don't have to write your name. You don't have to do anything. Once you are in, once you are hearing me, the system will record your registration. But try no, to... Alaikum salam. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me very well? We can. Yes, we hear you very well, uh, Hussein. Can you give me just one uh, ten seconds, Hussein? Okay, and then you can start. Can you hear me, Hussein? Excellent. Okay. So we'll start. You know, as uh, thank you, Dr. Muhammad uh, Faifi, for this uh, small introduction. Uh, I'll be with you guys uh, for the next two hours hours and a half discussing the pediatric triage and uh, the latest sepsis uh, can be a recommendation regarding uh, management and treating for sepsis in pediatric and we'll leave the question to the end uh, if you have any questions so let's start about you know the pediatric triage and how to assigning uh, a CTAS scores using the Canadian Emergency Department Information System with the chief complaint and the modifiers. Uh, as all of you know that triage is one of the important and hot zones in emergency, and it play a major role, you know, in treating pediatric patients and, you know, have a huge impact in their prognosis and outcomes uh, when it comes to the patient safety and quality at the end of the day. So if we have a, a good triage system, uh, a good trained nurses to do the triage for pediatric, for sure we will be having an excellent outcome and excellent service for those pediatric patients. So what are our objectives today? Uh, our objective mainly will be discussing, you know, uh, <clears throat> how to differentiate differentiate between adult and pediatric triage, how to apply the critical look at the beginning of the triage to the, uh, when it comes to pediatric assessment triangle, identify the presenting complaint and utilize the CM bids and interpret vital signs in pediatric patient, apply pediatric specific modifiers. These are will be mainly our you know, objectives today. So let's start by breaking down the eyes and talking about the principles of triage. Principle of triage actually goes back to the to the history, almost like you know, 80 years ago in the, in the World Wars II, you know, when they have you know mass casualties and a lot of people who's been injured and uh, involved in the war. So they have to have a sort of system that allow, you know, nurses and doctors at that time, you know, to save and rescue the most important uh, or patients who have a uh, high possibility of uh, life or they can, <clears throat> they, can uh, they can benefit from, you know, direct treatment or emergent treatment. At that time, you know, the, the idea of triage started evolving uh, in the medical care and uh, decade uh, after decade, this idea being, you know, developed and until we have like, you know, at the beginning of 2000, you know, the Canadian Emergency Association with the affiliation of nurses 
uh, association as well. They come up with, you know, uh, a sort of uh, what we call it today, uh, Canadian triage accuracy scale, which basically as a triage, you know, concerning about, you know, sorting out uh, and developing a process to sort out and uh, uh, recognize patients who are at a life threatening situation uh, using uh, nurses who are having a critical thinking, decision making, and <clears throat> those nurses, they should have been trained and have knowledge and experience. Now, m most of those patients, they will be pre presenting to the emergency with different, you know, presenting complaints, and based on their severity of this complaint, they will be triaged. What is the goal of the triage? As we mentioned, you know, there, is, there are life-threatening situations that need to be attended right away. Life-threatening situation, we're talking about threat to life, or threat to limb, or threat to organ. And if any patient presenting with any of these life-threatening situations, they should be given a higher scoring category in order for them to start treatment right away. Also, one of the main objectives to the triage is direct patient to the appropriate treatment area. One of the best, you know, uh, definition I would say uh, for the triage is right patient on the right time to the right place. So uh, m most of you are aware that, you know, ER has different, you know, zones and sections and every section or zone intended to treat different categories or different type of patients. So if you do have a patient who are uh, category four and five patients who are, uh, you know, uh, quick patients, they can be benefit from reassurance. Those patients should not be, you know, uh, mix up with patients who are in a life threatening situation. So if you put somebody who is uh, with a flu or upper respiratory tract infection in a cold room, you technically uh, congested your area and you putting the wrong patient in the, in the wrong place. And if you have somebody who's coming in a, in a cold you know, situation or in a restation situation, your rooms are full. So that's why uh, you need to have direct patient to the right uh, treatment areas. Decrease congestion in the ED. One of the most important actually roles uh, for the triage system is to decrease the congestion. And this is one of the driven factory actually, you know, started in the Europe and uh, in the North America to start to have a system. The system, you know, will evaluate and will decrease the crowd, the crowding in emergency. Uh, so if we have a better system, if we have nurses who are trained to do that and knowledgeable to do that, uh, we will have, you know, less waiting time. We'll have, you know, uh, patients, you know, seeing their physician on a timely manner, patient get discharged in a timely manner, and at the same time, patients who are in life threatening or potential life threatening situation, they will get seen also and saved. Assess also and determine severity, acute presenting problem for uh, for patients and ongoing. And all of you know that you know we don't have uh, a lot of beds uh, available in emergency, and most of the patient's complaints or patient experience, uh, you know, surveys come that they, they waited for a long time in emergency. Yes, for sure, we cannot have, you know, uh, we cannot provide bits for every single patient that come to the ER. Some of them has to wait, and some of them they get seen right away. Now, for the people who, who, wait, who wait in the waiting area, they should have an ongoing assessment to make sure that they will not deteriorate, to make sure that their condition will not change. And at the same time, if there's any changes in that condition, we will be able, you know, 
to recognize them and to see the early warning sign as soon as possible and intervene for the patient's safety. Do you guys hear me very well? Excellent. I'll be asking you this question from time to time just to make sure that first you are with me. Second, that you know I'm, uh, I'm loud and clear for you. As, as I said to you, uh, this tool is devised and tested by physician and nurses in Canada. And it was endorsed to the Emergency uh, Physicians uh, Association in affiliation with the Nurses uh, Association. And it was devised or, uh, and developed to organize the standard of emergency care. Now, uh, all of you know that you know the key indicator, the key performance indicator for any emergency department comes out from triage. So if they want to evaluate any ER, they will go to the triage and see these indicators. What is the time to see the physician? What is the time you know, to see the nurse? How long the patient waited to be before he goes inside? How long the patient you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> waited before he gets discharged? So all of these indicators are taken out from you know, the triage. So it's very important to have a tool that will able to help and uh, improve patient care and quality in emergency. All of you know also uh, that the CTAS, the Canadian Triage Accuracy Scale, has five levels. Level one is mainly concerning about restation, where patient should be seen immediately while level two is an emergency where patients should be seen within 15 minutes. I'm talking about physician, not nurses here. And in level three, uh, the urgent patient, those patients should be seen within 30 minutes. And level four is one hour. And the level five, which is the non-urgent, those patients can wait, you know, uh, two hours. Now, technically, uh, yes, there are there, these are the time frame for the patients to be seen by the physician. But we are we all abide to this? Are all emergency in the kingdom, you know, able to match these, you know, numbers? Uh, maybe it is very difficult, especially if you have uh, overcrowding in emergency, if you have a congested emergency. Uh, so sometimes these numbers are not, uh, quite impossible. Okay even in best hospital, but these are the guidelines. These are the, uh, the guidelines for, for the CTAS. Uh, we, we do what we can do to meet with these standards, okay? And to make sure at least level one and level two, they get seen as soon as possible and get treated. Now, this is a study done in, in, in Canada and it can show the reliability and validity of this tool, how reliable this tool and uh, uh, valid. And if you can see here, you know, the time for the physician to see and uh, category one or emergent restation is immediately. And if you can see, uh, now the fractal response may differ from hospital to hospital, how much, you know, physician they respond to this you know immediate time to see the patients so in their study 98 percent of their physician they were able you know to comply with the immediate you know uh, see assessment for the patient and intervention however our concern here if we look to the admission rate so if we have a category one 90 percent of those patients they get admitted and this is, tells you, you know, exactly how reliable this tool. While if you go to category five, which is the non-emergent patient, those patients, you know, their likelihood to be admitted is almost zero. So if you see, you know, uh, if you're linking your, your category and your assessment and your triage system to the admission rate, and you can see how reliable this tool. 
Now, if we break them down, those categories, okay, what are those categories? So we're talking about, you know, prostation, and those patients, they should be immediately in the room. They should be seen by a physician right away. They should be seen by the nurse right away. And they should not stop by the triage. Triage nurses should not waste their time, you know, triaging somebody who's category one. Those patients should benefit from any seconds to, to improve, you know, their likelihood of, uh, of life and, you know, uh, provide, you know, the best care for them uh, as soon as possible. This condition, we're talking about threat to life or limb and organ. Uh, and those patients, they may deteriorate right away and they became a right respiratory arrest or cardiac arrest. So they need aggressive intervention at this moment. They don't need a triage. They need actually aggressive intervention. What are the examples of those cases? First one is a cardiac arrest or respiratory arrest, a shock patient. Not necessarily that patient when a shock should be, you know, uh, with no vital signs. They might have still, you know, pulse. They might be, you know, significantly tachycardic, they might be, you know, hypotensive, maybe they are irritable, maybe agitated, maybe, you know, uh, they look very toxic. All of the signs of the shock, decompensated shock that patient might have, they may have, those patients should be categorized. So what we want to shift to, from our mind that prostation category one doesn't mean that the patient does not have a pulse or does not have, you know, uh, does not breathe. There are patients, they may deteriorate in one or two, three minutes. They need right away direct inver intervention to help them not to be in a respiratory arrest or cardiac arrest. Severe respiratory distress. And we will break them, you know, these modifiers later on. Altered mental status, patient who, are, who their GCS is less than nine, or patient with actively seizing, traumatic amputation, patient with motor vehicle accident, fall from, you know, a, a high level, all those patients they consider, you know, as category one, there's no need for them. And they should not wait in the triage for the triage. Those patients should be moved right away to the code room. Talking about the second one, which is emergent, those patients, you know, also technically, if you have a rooms in the emergency, those patients should not be stopped by the triage. Those patients, if you have a bed, should not should be directed right away to the bed. If you have no bed, and this is based on your facility policies, those patients can be triaged and you know, uh, get try to move somebody else, you know, to get them inside. Uh, example, now the time here for the nurse is immediate and the time for the physician is 15 minutes. What are those cases that, that might be, you know, a, a category two or emergency? Patient, you know, seizure post active, chemical exposure to eye, uh, decreasable consciousness with GCS less than, you know, 12. High risk manic mechanism of injury, uh, as we spoke, and just pain uh, cardiac. Now, those conditions, they have potentially to develop life threatening situations. So they require not aggressive. Uh, guys, I'm seeing you write comments. Anything? Do you have any comments? Do you hear me very well? Okay. Just, you know, making sure that you guys with me. And those potential, you know, they may develop, you know, life affecting situations, so they benefit from, you know, medical in intervention that it should be quick. 
Now, urgent, this is, you know, time is here for the physician and the nurse is the same 30 minutes and the time for the reassessment is 30 minutes. And those patients, they may have mild respiratory distress, acute moderate central head injury with loss of consciousness, diarrhea with mild dehydration, and seizure for the patient is alert. Those conditions, they could potentially progress to serious problems. So we are not talking here and We are not talking here about, you know, a life-threatening or potential to develop a life-threatening situation. We're talking about serious problems. So we make sure that those patients, they get seen with 30 minutes and assist, you know, by the nurse and physician. When it comes to level four, those patients, they can wait, as we said, you know, up to 60 minutes before they get seen by the physician or the nurse. And those patients, this, those conditions usually uh, related to the patient age, potential deterioration, or complication would benefit from reassurance or intervention uh, within one to two hours. What, what are the examples of category four? Uh, example of fever, but patient looks well. Mild acute pain central, okay, and laceration breathing control uh, requiring sutures, head injury, no loss of consciousness, normal vital signs, and burn, burn less than 5% of body surface, not including the face or the hands. And the last one is uh, category five. Those patients, they can wait up to two hours. The time for them to be seen by the physician or the nurse inside is two hours. Those patients usually, they have condition might be acute, and, but not urgent. Those conditions be part of their chronic problem, and usually they don't deteriorate. Upper respiratory tract infection, laceration does not need suturing, and mild diarrhea but no dehydration. So this is a breakdown of those, you know, time frame. So as we said, you know, not all the patients will get the rooms inside. So you you will still have some patients they have to wait. Okay, and patients who get weight outside, they need to be reassessed based on the CTAS time frame. And the time frame is, uh, now for level one, they are inside, level two, most of the time they are inside, but if it happens, a level two has no bed, okay? The time frame for reassessment is 15 minutes. The time frame for reassessment for a category three or urgent patient is 30 minutes, while it goes up to 60 minutes in category four and to two hours in category five. Now, what are the, the golden principles or the rules uh, for the triage? That CTAS level, you know, based on the system approach, we should not be use our, you know, experience our, you know, own, you know, expectations or uh, our own decision when it comes to patient triaging. We have a system, we should follow the system, and the system is being built, you know, to help this emergency department to help patient to be uh, safe. Now, several presenting components may be, appear in different level, indicating various severity of to each condition. Uh, example of that, you know, you might have somebody with upper respiratory tract infection or, you know, flu. It might be, you know, category five, and you might have somebody with a flu. He is category one. And this is all based on the modifiers. Experience. 
And if you have a nurse who has been like, you know, more than 10, 15 years in triage, they should use their experience, okay, uh, to up triage patients, not to down triage patients. So uh, experience should be used as extra, you know, uh, <clears throat> factor to improve uh, triaging with the patient. And it should not be, you know, an obstacle, okay, that nurses, they may use to down triage patients. And uh, also if patients, you know, look sick, if a pediatric, a baby child, he looks sick despite his normal vital signs in front of you, Believe me, he's a sick, and they're truly sick. There's no question about that. So if they are sick, they are sick. And uh, if you are in a doubt about a case, is he category two or three, always have triage the patient. That would be more safer for the patient. You will still have some cases that you will have some, you know, uh, a debate about it, or you might pause for a second, even if, even if you are experienced. Uh, and in those cases, you know, if you see there's a hesitation, or you're not sure, or you are uh, not 100% sure about, you know, the category, it's better to over triage them. And this is, will bring, you know, the best or the, and will and predict the worst case scenarios. <clears throat> we'll talk about the modifiers, we'll talk about the triage acuities, how does start the presenting complaint of the patient, why the patient is there, vital signs, pain severity and mechanism of injury. So at the beginning when the when the child you know enter the emergency department, you will have the nurse who is sitting at the desk, you know, as you know, a visual rapid assessment nurse who will see the patients, okay, from outside. And she can decide, you know, without doing vital signs, without interviewing the patient, is the patient from the critical look, is he sick or not? Does he need, you know, to be inside right away to the treatment area, or he can wait for the whole process for a triage for 10 minutes? This is all done by the nurse who's sitting at the desk outside. After that, you know, you should have some uh, disc, you know, for the infection control, especially with, with what is going on now with the COVID and, you know, all respiratory infection, just to isolate patients, you know, who are ha showing, you know, uh, a high, you know, respiratory symptoms and from other patients. Those patients should be, you know, isolated. They should be given a uh, face mask, okay, and should be away from other patients in a different or in isolated respiratory area. Then the question comes after that, you know, when the patient meets the triad nurse is uh, about the presenting complaint. Why the patient is here in emergency? What brought you to emergency today? And after that, you start doing your modifiers and apply these modifiers, primary, or if there's a need for secondary modifiers. After we've done all of this, you will be able to assign your patient the category. If, you, if he has a bed, you move him inside right away. If no bed, patient goes to the waiting area. The process is a dynamic, and we will continue monitoring the patient while in the waiting area based on the time frame of the CTAS.
This is the uh, pediatric assessment tool. Just a quick, you know, reference so you can remember when you ask the patient about all of this. The chief complaint of the patient, why the patient is here today, what brought you to emergency, uh, how can I help you today, and should be, you know, a single or two words only. Uh, immunization, isolation, okay, allergies if there's any allergies, medication, what medication the child using, and the past medical history, and the caregiver prescription of illness, events surrounding, you know, the illness or the injury, you need to understand what happened with the baby, okay, diet and diaper, what we call it, you know, as documentation, intake and output. Okay, what, is he vomiting? Is he taking orally very well? Uh, what type of oral he's taking? Okay, is the diaper wet? How many times the, the mom changed the diaper? And this is will give you an idea about the intake output and symptoms associated with the illness or injury. And this is very important to be mentioned. Okay, what are the symptoms that with the fever? Does, does the patient complain from neck rigidity? Does the patient have a rash, you know? Many caregivers, if you don't ask them, you know, those questions, they will not tell you that the patient having this and that. So you need to be uh, smart enough, okay? And ask all the questions that give you, you know, a signs of symptoms for with, the, with this presentation. This is how the system will look like. And you can see the adult and pediatric will be cl clicking on the pediatric modifiers. Now, this is all depends on your facility, you know, uh, rules and laws. If they decide, you know, how much, you know, they, how much, how, how is, what is the cut of age for the pediatric in your hospital? Is it 13? or is it 14 or is it 17? Can you tell me what is the cut of age of pediatric in your hospital? Fourteen. Fourteen. So 14 is adult. Okay, some of you said 18. So many of you think, you know, uh, the cutoff is 14. Uh, even in our hospital, you know, 14 consider adult, 13 consider pediatric. So uh, this system is built up, up to 17 because it's a Canadian, they consider 17 years old and below are pediatrics. And if, yeah, if you can see here in the little bar here you can see the modifiers okay but we are clicking on other there's modifiers for pediatric as well and those modifiers some of these modifiers we call them you know primary modifiers or and some of them secondary This is the pediatric one. You see the color change here. And this is the respiratory, you know, in the in the C test for pediatric. And you can see what are the complaints the patient may come uh, with: shortness of breath, respiratory foreign body, allergic reaction, strider, apneic spills hyperventilation, hemoptysis, cough, congestion, and wheezing. These are the most, you know, uh, these are the most complaints reported by, you know, the caregiver and pediatric when they are ad admitted to emergency. This is the gastrointestinal, you know, and has other, you know, subcategories under the gastrointestinal. 
And we're talking now about modifiers. When we talk about the modifiers, the first line modifiers or the primary modifiers, these modifiers, the primary should be done for every single patient attending to emergency. So any patient come to emergency should have those primary modifiers done, okay, in their triage assessment. What are those primary modifiers? The first uh, primary modifiers is your vital signs. Every single pediatric patient should have vital signs done when they do their triage. Now we're talking about vital signs. We're talking about, you know, uh, liver consciousness. We're talking about, you know, the hemodynamic. We're talking about respiratory and temperatures. So we need to know if the patient's febrile or not febrile. We need to know if the patient, you know, the kibnet, not the kibnet. We need to know about is is the patient in shock or he is not in shock based on the you know the uh, the heart rate based on the color based on the clinical picture of the patient and based on the you know physiological parameters like you know heart rate or blood pressure. Second one is the liver consciousness and. Uh, also, you know, a patient is unconscious. He's, as you all see, unconscious patients from three to nine, they are level one, while level two is altered liver consciousness. 10 to 13 is category two. So based on this and those modifiers, you can see bleeding disorder are uh, considered one of the first modifiers, okay, or the modifiers. If the patient, you know, have a, a life threatening bleeding, okay, and he's known to have a bleeding disorder, whether it's a congenital or it is, you know, a, a <clears throat> congenital a bleeding disorder or because of medication that the patient is using, example of that heparin, Mechanism of injury if patient has a motor vehicle accident or patient is uh, has a fall from more than three meters. Pain and decide what kind. Uh, now, if patient having a pain, you know, and the pain is severe. Pain, acute severe pain and the pain is central we consider that category one if the pain is a chronic even if it's 10 and the maximum category will be three and this is all considered our first modifiers or the modifiers or primary modifiers Again, this is the first step that we talked about it, which is, you know, the pediatric critical look. And in this step, we, we talked about, you know, the general appearance, the work of breathing and circulation. Now, in this step, uh, we're talking about without doing any vital signs, without, you know, touching the patient, maybe, or just, you know, a, a, a critical look. And when we say a critical look, that means this is in depth. This is a very experienced look for somebody who has, you know, critical thinking and uh, have been, you know, working in pediatric for quite, you know, some time. They will be able to detect these signs without, you know, touching or taking vital signs of the patient. So you look to the work of the breathing with the patient. Is the patient, you know, tachypneic? Is he using accessory muscles? Is the patient, you know, able to speak or not? And you look to the general appearance of the patient, okay? How does the patient appear? Does they appear, you know, flabby, lethargic, or they are active, irritable? Does the patient, you know, with circulation, you look to the color of the patient. Is, is he dusky? Is he cyanotic? Is he, you know, pinkish? So all of this without doing any kind of vital signs. After that, you will ask, you know, the presenting component based on the master list.
Now, if we take them one by one, those modifiers, and we spoke about, you know, deliberate consciousness. So any patient is not responding, any patient is, you know, uh, have a progressive de deterioration in their liver consciousness. Uh, if, he ha if he is unable to protect his airway, those patients, they consider our category one because GCS is, uh, you know, below nine. There's a huge, you know, possibility that they may, you know, uh, lose their airway, so those patients, they've been categorized as one, you know, to, as we said, there's a life-threatening situation, there's airway compromised here, and we need to protect and make sure that the airway is patent. When it comes to the patients who have uh, altered liver consciousness, those patients, they are, their liver consciousness between 10 to 13, they are irritable, they might be, you know, a little bit lethargic, obtunded, okay, localizing to painful stimuli, that the number one, they are not responding. Those patients, they are localizing to the uh, stimulus. Uh, they might be inconsolable, they might be combative, Poor feeding an infant and all those patients they consider, you know, uh, decreased liver consciousness, but GCS is between 10 to 30. And these are the beats hemodynamic modifiers. We're talking about the shock, and the shock we relate that to the sepsis again. Now, in sepsis, uh, which is severe in organ hypoperfusion, you will have the patient is in severe tachycardia, marked paler, cool skin, postural syncope, and with significant tachycardia or bradycardia. Those patients, you know, might be in septic shock. They appear very toxic, very ill, okay? They might be flushed, okay? They might be, especially if they are, you know, suffering from, uh, you know, uh, warm shock, or they might be cold, clammy, if they are suffering from, you know, uh, a cold shock. And those patients, as we said, should be, should be triaged as category one. And if you can see here, the heart rate for patients from zero to two zero to two months. Okay, if you have a, a patient who is six months here and his heart rate is 200. Okay, those patients, they are being, you know, in a blue, that me then they are category one because they have a significant red tachycardia. Now, for patients who is hemodynamically compromised, there is, you know, delay in their cabrifil, skin changes such as poor tissue perfusion. However, they, they have a signs of dehydration, and but they are not to the point that are, you know, severely uh, hypoperfused. Those patients still there is blood going to the tissue and cells. But this blood tissue and cells is not enough, you know, to meet the, uh, the demand of the baby. So this patient, they uh, consider a category two because they are hemodynamically compromised. And this is based on their vital signs. Example, a six-month baby with a heart rate of 175, this patient is considered category two. Now, it comes to category three for the hemodynamic, those, those patients, they have, you know, volume depletion, they have abnormal vital signs, but the rest of their, you know, organs and body are working uh, good. This is, uh, this table show you, you know, uh, exactly, you know, if a patient, you know, will take patient who is three months, Okay, and if he is level two, we can see about his heart rate, okay, less than 25, 
and if we're talking about level two heart rate should be you know uh, more than 189. Now, this is the respiratory modifiers. I know all of you, maybe in your hospital, nobody is using the peak expiratory flow meter. Uh, but the message today is do not depend on the vital signs when you're triaging the baby. And this is, uh, this is one of the main you know, issues that we see and we should be able to uh, identify and recognize as nurses and healthcare providers. Patient, especially with the patient, their initial, you know, impression is uh, sometimes can't be detected by vital signs, and sometimes vital signs are not reliable if your patient is too much sick. So you don't look at the saturation. And you said saturation is like 90 algorithm one, okay, or if it is between 92 to 94. He's uh, you know, or 92 to 91, he's category two, and from 92 to 94 to 95, he's category two, three. It doesn't work like this, okay? We need to look to the clinical picture of the patient because you have many patients, they might have a congenital, you know, cardiac issue that their normal saturation is 90 or 88. So we cannot take this for a grant that, you know, any patient with uh, saturation of 90 should be category two. No, we need to look to the whole picture to decide if this, if these numbers are matching with the patient, you know, uh, with the patient presentation. So when we when we speak about patient in severe respiratory distress, we're speaking about patient who are having cyanosis. Lethargic, confusion, irritability, agitation. Okay, sometimes they can't speak, you know, uh, more than one word. So they can't give you a sentence or phrases. So those patients, that means they are having, you know, uh, severe respiratory distress. They might have, you know, accessory muscle, flaring, grunting, okay, and retraction. And those patients, they might deteriorate at any single moment. When it comes to the moderate, those patients, they have increased work of breathing. And this work of breathing, they still have, you know, mild increased use of accessory muscles, not severe. And uh, they might have strider or wheezes. But if you look to the table here for the respiratory rate from, you know, Two to to 18. So if you have somebody whose age is 18 and the special rate is, you know, 30, she should be referred to the, uh, should be given a category one. This is also for respiratory rate guidelines. Now fever. One of the most, you know, a presentation for patients who comes to the ER is the fever. And uh, especially if your patient is immunocompromised and or in chemo medication or a medication that can, that can you know, uh, suppress the immunity, those patients, if they are presenting with fever or history of fever or suspicious of neutropenia, they should be categorized as category two. If patient is less than three months, okay, and has a temperature, this than 36 or above than more than 38, those patients is two because our main concern here is neonatal sepsis. Patients who are from three months to, to three years and having temperature less than 32 or more than 35 uh, or more than 38.5 and non-toxic case uh, we give them three and patient if they are more than three years and temperature more than 38.5 and appearing well and well. So. Pain also acute and uh, moderate. We spoke about this. 
and the beat uh, bleeding disorder congenital or acquired so if you have somebody who are having a massive vaginal hemorrhage uh, 12 years or 13 years old with massive and she is known to have a, a, congen a congen congenital you know a bleeding disorder it should be triaged as category two mechanism of injury and in this one you can see one level which is level two which will be triaging and somebody with pedestrian or uh, fall or ventilating injury and uh, motor vehicle collision or fall as category three all of them they should be category two at least do you hear me very well can you please answer Okay, excellent. Nobody is leaving. So let's take them, you know, case by case, and we will apply this to the CTAS. So let's say, uh, let's see this case. Uh, eight years old, healthy child, present to ED with history, with his father, complains of having diarrhea for three days has had a decrease in oral intake and no complaint of nausea or vomiting. Dry mucous membrane looks tired and not feeling well, no complaint of pain or fever. Blood pressure is 89 over 53 and heart rate is 128, respiratory rate is 24. So, the presentation, the uh, chief complaint presentation is diarrhea. So we apply the, the critical look for this patient. Then we go to the gastrointestinal and we click on diarrhea, right? So the minimum triage for diarrhea, the minimum triage category for diarrhea is Category five. While the maximum, you know, it can be one. So when when patient can be a category one, if that patient have severe dehydration, and you can see at the bottom of the page, they tell you go to the dehydration definition. And this is what tell you if your patient having severe or moderate or mild dehydration. And what are the signs and symptoms for patients uh, to have a severe dehydration or moderate dehydration? And this is, you know, the dehydration definition. A patient with severe dehydration Mark volume loss with the classic signs of dehydration and signs of symptomatic or hypovolemic shock. Those patients, they consider category one. If they have severe dehydration, moderate dehydration, category two, and mild dehydration, category three. Potential dehydration is category four. Now, this is the shock. We spoke about the hemodynamic modifiers. And if you go to our case again, you can see that the patient is, is he tachycardic a little bit and blood pressure? So this is, you know, we talk about, you know, he is, what age he is on, he is eight years old. So we're talking about eight years old. Okay, heart rate 128. We take this. He's in the red zone, so this patient should be category two. And this is an emergent patient, should be treated 
and if you have a room to get in. You guys, you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can Excellent. hear you very I'm well. Somebody is uh, saying you. there's no voice. We hear you very well, Hussein. So, excellent. Somebody wrote moderate dehydration. Yes, it is a moderate dehydration. That why this patient should be given a category two. Okay, we'll carry on. And this is as you see the heart rate. Another case. Now, this is you know a, a very frequent you know sometimes you know. A uh, visit to the ER, a four-day-old infant presented to ER uh, with his mother, brought because of jaundice. The infant is jaundiced and irritable. Uh, anterior fontanel is slightly sunken and oral mucosa is tacky. Muscle tone and activity are normal. So we'll go to the jaundice, right? So this is the pediatric, the COT. So we go to the jaundice here in pediatric, and you have three categories only. You have one, two, three. Unated jaundice, you have three categories only. If a patient, you know, is a, can be category one based on their vital signs or based in the modifiers, okay? Whether the patient is not responding to a term category one unconscious or patient showing, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, a patient in a shock or in severe respiratory distress. The other thing you also for category two, also based on their, if they are in moderate respiratory distress, hemodynamic compromise, or they have altered liver consciousness between 10 to 13. Now for any patients who, now we remove the modifiers in category two or three, any infant who is less than seven days of age, okay, and presented with jaundice, regardless of the vital sign, should be category two. Any infant more than you know seven days of age and up normal vital sign, they should be categorized as level three. Another scenario, we'll give you a couple of scenarios before we move to the next topic. A four-year-old boy present to ED with his mother with two-day history of shortness of breath and cough. Audible wheezes is noted, accessory muscle use, child is speaking only phrases. I want you to write in your comments what do you think about this case. I'll give you two, three minutes. Write what you think about this case, then we will go to the system to solve this triage.
Okay, guys. I just wanted to assure one thing for you before if you are triaging any patients. You know, our aim is not to not to diagnose the patients. I'm not, you know, I'm not too much, you know, keen to know if this patient have a stri if this patient has a croup, or he has a, having viral laryngitis, or if this patient, you know, complaining of asthma, or is it asthmatic attack, or it is allergic reaction. Is is not my, you know, point in the triage. You know what is the diagnosis? You know, my point is to categorize the patient based based on their presenting complaint. So forget about asthma, forget about, you know, viral laryngitis, forget about, you know, a croup, forget about, you know, allergic reaction. What we're looking for here is about, you know, the patient presentation. Remember, there is no pulse oximetry in this case. They did not put the saturation for you. And this is the most important thing, okay, is looking about the clinical picture, the triangle for pediatric, in order to assign the right category. So let's move in to the respiratory. So we click on the shortness of breath. And from the shortness of breath, the minimum category can be four, and the maximum is one. Let's again go back to the scenario. Patient is two days of shortness of breath with cuff. Audible wheezes is noted. Okay, with accessory muscle, and the child is speaking only phrases. Now, if the patient not in distress, he's four. If the patient, in order to make him number one, I should have patient should be in a shock, or unconscious, or severe respiratory distress. My patient not in severe response to this. Now remember, in order to know those modifiers, you can click on respiratory and see what is the respiratory modifiers, if you forget this. As we said, we are not using the big expiratory flow meter, okay, for those patients. But we'll open now the respiratory modifiers. And this is, this is the most important thing to look at, is the severity of this respiratory. Is the patient severe, moderate, mild? Is, look at the severe. Patient have excessive work of breathing, cyanosis, lethargy, confusion, and none of those, you know, are presented with our patients. If you go to the moderate, has a moderate work of breathing, and anxious, combativeness, tachypnea, hyperopnea, mild increased use of accessory muscles, attraction, speaking only phrases. And this is our patient. So the patient, if you are talking about the mild response, this patient will be able to speak a full sentence. Now we talk about four years old. Four years old, he is able to speak. But when it comes to the, uh, to the kids who are less than one year or who are less than six months, you need to look to other, you know, clinical pictures when it's time to, you know, tachycardia, lethargy, irritability, inability to recognize the caregiver or cyanosis or, you know, uh, tachypnea. If there's no obvious increase of work breathing, this patient is category three. Now, I uh, can't remember what is, what was uh, his respiratory rate. So there's no mention about respiratory rate, but if a respiratory rate, you know, mentioned or you have it there, you can go to the, to the CTAS respiratory rate age from zero to two months uh, to two years and from two to years to 18. And all of these modifiers are available. You can use them. And this is, you know, a, a study done to see the validity and reliability of this, you know, tool to be used in a pediatric and emergency department. And that was in 2010. Uh, and this is, there was, you know, overall interrater agreement that this tool was 
you know, good and can be, you know, uh, used in a pediatric uh, emergency. So we're done for the first uh, uh, lecture. Do you have any question, guys? These both your question now. So if we have, we can answer them now before we move to the second one. I'll give you five minutes, okay, just, you know, before we move to the next topic, which is the pediatric sepsis guidelines. Okay, guys, uh, let's continue. We'll continue first about the pediatric. Can you see the screen? Okay, so we'll give you some tips. Okay, excellent. We, we give you some tips. About, you know, uh, how to differentiate and how to use the C test for pediatric. This is will help you and to apply the modifiers. As we all said before, we said that you know the triage is different when it comes to the. Okay, we'll be hopefully finishing today like 3:30. Just will take half an hour to review this pediatric, you know, modifiers again, and uh, then we'll start the sepsis. So what are the pediatric, you know, standards or assessment techniques that we need uh, to use when we interviewing specific patients or pediatric patients, and what are the pediatric specific, specific you know, modifiers can be used. We're not talking about the five levels. We discussed this. We will not. We discussed the triage process as well. Uh, what's you know the difference between adult and pediatric? Uh, we said you know uh, there are you know the applying the pediatric assessment triangle 
and this is before the patient enter the room across the room when the patient enter from the gate or from the door of the ER we should be able to use the pad and uh, identify you know the triangle for pediatric patient anatomy and physiological assessment for pediatric is different from adults significance of presenting compliance symptoms differ from uh, adult as well symptoms are reported usually not by the by the pediatric patient or by the children usually the symptoms reported by the caregiver or by the family or by the you know <clears throat> anybody is taking care of pediatric at home significant impact of age development and psychological concentration as all of you are aware that you know as as the pediatric patient or the child is growing up, you know, their psychological needs and the psychological developmental and physiological changes uh, continue to develop from age to age. There are special you know, circumstances may include, you know, congenital anomalies for the patient, you know, that we should be taking in our consideration when we triage them, metabolic diseases, Technology dependent children, a lot of them we're seeing them now. Uh, developmentally challenged ch children, and we should keep always in our mind the child mild treatment of child abuse. Yes, our culture, our uh, religion, our uh, is, uh, is uh, again, you know, uh, always safe for children, but we still do see cases where child abuse or my treatment might happen so keep it in your mind having your know, policy having a procedure having a pathway you know to protect children when you there is a suspicious for a child abuse or maltreatment so anatomical differences we'll talk about the anatomical differences and physiological differences in pediatric uh, relatively, they have a large head. It's sometimes it's two thirds of their body. They have a smaller airway, so they always presenting with respiratory symptoms. Okay, their breathing pattern change with their you know time of their age, you know, and they have a smaller size. Weight dependent therapy. Uh, we should get their weight for any uh, medication for any IV fluid uh, should be calculated based on their. Weight. While in adult, sometimes we have a standard dose for our medication. Sometimes we have uh, uh, an, uh, IV fluid are not all usually calculated by their weight. When we come to their physiological changes, okay, they have immature immune sy system. That's why you know, age less than three months, we should always be careful when we triage them because they have you know immature you know immune system they might have neonatal sepsis they might have subtle you know symptoms that you know could you know uh, cause them you know disease and because of their uh, abnormal immune uh, system or undeveloped immune system those patients that might have sepsis increase their metabolic rates uh, increase body service area smaller circulating blood volume they have higher blood volume, kidneys are unable to concentrate urine, and their heart rates vary with their age. So you cannot say that somebody whose you know, heart rate is 180 is uh, he's three months, and you said, okay, uh, because in adult we have always, you know, a heart rate above 100 is tachycardia. But in pediatric, it's different from age to age, from uh, if he is a neonatal or if he is infant or if he is a uh, preschooler or if he's a toddler, you know, there are, you know, ranges for the normal vital signs. Uh, they have an increased metabolic rate. They don't have a reservoir. They don't store glycogen, so they easily get dehydrated. They easily get hypoglycemia, especially if they are uh, that's why, you know, we talked about severe dehydration, they are category one. Uh, there are differences when it comes to their psychosocial differences, okay, if they are, you know, from 
zero to one years, they like the cuddling, soother music, okay, while they are in age of 12, their body image is the most important, you know, thing. You need to interview them alone. Examine general appearance and level of consciousness. Note that the child emotional response to stimuli, anxiety, difference. Uh, always think also about the child abuse. Does the story make sense? Is what you hear, is what you see, you know, or when you see any trauma, when you see any fall, when you see any fracture, uh, you need to listen to the, to the story from the caregiver, from the parents, okay? And does the story make sense for you? And is, is it suspicious how frequent he has this fall and fractures? Critical look, we spoke about this. And a very important, you know, tip, you know, sleeping babies consider are uh, unconscious uh, until proven otherwise. So if you have a, a mother, you know, wrapping her baby, uh, you need to, and she told you that the baby is sleeping, you need to wake them up to make sure that they are awakeable, to make sure that they are arousable, okay? And uh, wake them. Child's head and torso need to be observed. Need to be observed. The patient might have rashes, they might have, you know, uh, signs of child abuse, all of them. So expose them to make sure and wake them, you know, to do a real assessment for them. So are they alert and responsive? Are they inter interacting with the caregiver? They do have normal skin color, eye general appearance. If there's any speech or crying, are they laughing? You know, usually, especially when they are from zero to one, okay? Usually uh, kids, they like, you know, the, the cuddling and soothing, you know, the soothing. They usually, they smile, okay? And if you don't see a smile for those kids, you know, probably they are very sick. Are they dressed? You know, uh, this is again about question about their child abuse and, you know, uh, content or consolable. Are they inconsolable or not? If the kid's inconsolable, that we think he's irritable and he might be agitated, might be, you know, having some uh, behavioral changes. Now, uh, usually when we speak about adult, you know, we, we usually uh, said to the nurses that, you know, if a patient comes with a presenting complaint of, you know, uh, feeling unwell or uh, tired or fatigue, those words are very, uh, you know, dangerous and very risky because under the umbrella of fatigue, patient might have, a, you know, acute MI or acute stroke. And under the change in behavior in pediatric, this word, you know, should, you know, uh, always be a worrisome for the triage nurse. Change in behavior could be acute meningitis. Change in behavior could be acute metabolic, uh, you know, presentation. Change in behavior could, could be sepsis. Uh, it could be, you know, child maltreatment. Uh, it should be, uh, you know, uh, intoxicated. So any change of behavior, it should not be less than category two, okay? So if a patient, you know, was okay today and all of a sudden became, you know, uh, not talking or patient became, you know, uh, not communicating, those, you know, or became flubby, uh, became irritable, agitated, inconsolable, this lethargy, these words, you know, should, you know, really be at least category two or higher. Uh, again, the work of breathing, you know, a marked decrease in respiratory effort may signal of life threatening situation. This is, uh, when you have somebody who's tachypneic, this is a, a, a body response, you know, to improve, you know, uh, to correct the acidosis and wash out the CO2. Now, if, the, if they, this uh, 
tachypnea or increased work breathing or severe respiratory stress continue for a period of time, these muscles, you know, diaphragmatic muscles, the intercostal muscles, they get tired and they reach to the point, you know, that are not responding to the stimulus from the pain and they reach to the point that the patient, instead of being tachypnic, he start to be, you know, decrease in the respiratory rate. When you see at this point, now, not always decreases the respiratory rate means that the patient is improving. It is a sign of the muscle they are getting fatigue and the patient is moving slowly to the respiratory arrest. So this should be a worry for you, should not be, you know, a, a good sign. When it comes to the circulation, we said look to the color, to the, uh, if there's any bleeding, uh, sunken fontanel eyes if there's a recent the patient looks you know uh, losing weight dry mucous membrane skin is mottling uh, assist liver consciousness all of this you can see it by the critical look again wake up sleeping babies okay interview before you touch the child and this is can you know help or decrease the anxiety by the child you should not touching them right away or doing their vital signs without you know start sort of communication with the care with the caregiver at least they will feel a little bit you know safe so you can proceed with your you know uh, your assessment now check the caregiver perception of illness do most invasive examination at the end of the assessment when you speak about pediatric invasive examination we are talking about, you know, you know, temperature, we're talking about blood pressure, we're talking about pulse oximetry. All of this is considered invasive for pediatric. And this is may cause, you know, the, the child to cry and to, you know, uh, not to be comfortable. That's why we call them invasive. Unlike the adult, you know, Invasive mean you know, putting a needle or central line or just a tube or nasogastric. No, pediatrics when it comes to there, you know, simple vital signs considered invasive. Always, always think about you know the isolation for those patients if they have any signs of respiratory symptoms. Now, the pediatric chief complaints are different from adults. There are different lists, okay? The most common pediatric presenting complaints are fever, respiratory difficulties, and vomiting, diarrhea, uh, change in behavior. I want you always to think about change in behavior because this is a very common, very serious, very worrisome, you know, uh, presentation for pediatric. These are other examples of, you know, uh, complaint. As we said, when you interview them, do the invasive procedure at the end. Okay, do not start by taking the temperature to the pediatric because if you start, you will you will break up the whole interview. You will not have you will not have time, you know, even to listen to the mother or to the father or to the caregiver. You need to do all of these at the end. Then after that, if you there's any, the invasive procedures, okay, you can do them last. Talk about the CM beats, the vital signs, first order, second order modifiers. Now, first order modifier should be completed for all patients, okay? And those vitals, they vary depending on the age and development of the patient, must be considered, you know, with general appearance in triage level assignment. And this is very important, you know. Those modifiers should be, you know, uh, analyzed with the clinical appearance or clinical picture of the patients, okay? If the patient looks, you know, pinkish, okay, and he has no respiratory distress, well, and you took pulse oximetry and found the pulse oximetry is 85. This is for sure there's something wrong, okay, with the, with the machine, with the probe. So it shouldn't, should be interpreted based on the patient, you know, clinical picture. 
And level one and two have abnormal vital signs. Level one patient have unstable abnormal vital signs. Now, because vital signs, you know, determination, how should I, you know, determine this is a normal vital signs for this patient? How should I determine this is a normal vital signs for this patient? I need to make sure that those vital signs taken while the patient is required. And uh, abnormal vital signs will determine, and because you using your vital signs to determine the C-test level, they should be done accurately. They should be done while the patient is required, you know. If the patient is moving, crying, and you try to take, you know, pulse oximetry, you will not have a normal, you know, reading. You will not have a normal wave. Now, if your patient looks, you know, a very sick patient and you have a normal si vital signs and this is what we call the pre-cardiopulmonary arrest state and remember that kids you know or children they have a better you know system or body mechanism to compensate more than the adult so they compensate for longer period of time but when they crash they crash you know quickly and sometimes difficult to bring them back while adults you know they easily decompensate but also their you know mechanism bringing them back easier than the pediatric think about all of this you know when you try it respiratory rate assist measure and listen as we spoke about the modifiers a patient is cyanotic lethargic confusion unable you know, to speak or speaking one word, he's in severe speaking phrases, com uh, increased work breathing, he's too mild respiratory, he'll be able to speak full sentence. Oxygen saturation measurement. Uh, sometimes it's difficult, as we said, you know, the kids, they get scared from the prop, okay? And once you tie the prop in there, you know, finger they will start to move and they cry and you will not get a reading so it is you know uh, advisable that you wait till they are quiet and measure their saturation and interpret this measurement with the patient the clinical picture and always use the right size for them okay uh, you may change you know try to get the saturation for the mother okay because they they get scared from anything, okay? As we said, this is an invasive, okay? Do it on the mother, measure the saturation for the mother, then try to measure the saturation for the baby. I'll mention a couple of things before we move into the, the sepsis. Fever. Now, one of the most common presenting complaints is bringing children to the ED is fever, as all of you know. Uh, it is a specific modifiers in young infant and immunocompromised. Vitals modifier must be used to assign triage. Okay, fever protocols for initial treatment reassessment should be utilized. Now, how do, how do we measure, you know, the, the, the definitive or the recommended techniques to measure? If a patient from, you know, 30 days to two years, the first choice is Richter. So the definitive, you know, temperature for those patients to, to do is rectal temperature. Second choice is uh, axillary, which considers screening. If they are more than two years to five years, four, first choice again is rectal. Second choice is ear. And third choice is axillary. And above five years, the fair choice is oral. Patient is from zero to three months, more, more than 38, he's category two. As we said, you know, those patient is high risk for sepsis. Patient all ages, okay, above 38, and they are immunocompromised, 
transplant or you know medication that may suppress their immunity they are category two if they are three months and uh, up to three years if their temperature more than 38.5 they looks unwell they are two if they looks well they are three more than three years temperature more than 38.5 and they looks unwell they are three if they are less than if they looks well they are category four this is one of the answer you ask about you know we have difficulties about as we said you know most of the presentation is fever if your patient looks well and his temperature 38.5 and he is above three years this is category four Now for the pain assessment, it's very important to look for the pain assessment for pediatric. And intense pain can be associated with benign process, otitis media. Now tachycardia, paler, sweating, and other physiological signs are useful in evaluation of the pain level. And past experience may influence the child's reaction to illness. Okay, patients, if they are, you know, comes frequently, you'll see them, they come to the hospitals. They cry from the minute they enter the hospital. And you have to use different pain scales to uh, I recognize, identify, and score the pain. This is, we discuss it about the pain assessment, different pain scales, oh, bleeding so, so. disorder we talk about. <laughs> Mechanism of injury, the minimum we triage them as two. We talk about the second or, um, modif order modifiers, which is about the uh, dehydrations, but also blood glucose level is one of the second order modifiers. We do second order modifiers not for all patients. You do it for the patients who are, you know, presenting with decreased oral intake, rejecting feeds, uh, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, and uh, increased respiratory rate. We talk about increase or increased work breathing because especially infants and when they start to, have to be tachypneic or increasing their work breathing, they will not be able to get, you know, a uh, feed. So in order, they might, as we said, you know, they have increased metabolic rate, they don't have, they don't store glycogen, they might be easily hypoglycemic. So you need to do for them glucose. Blood pressure, do we do blood pressure? Blood pressure is the late indicator for serious circulatory volume problems. So we don't do it for all the patients. We do it for patients who are taking, you know, antihypertensive medication, patients with renal diseases, patients, you know, uh, condition that associated with hypertension or medication that may affect the blood pressure. But we don't do it for, first, it is very difficult, you know, to get the blood pressure for pediatric. Okay, uh, they, they don't stay calm and quiet, so you get the right reading. When we consider pediatric as hypertension, if they are, you know, above 95 percentile of their age. So if we're talking about somebody who is five years old and his systolic blood pressure is 112, we're talking that this patient have, you know, a hypertension. These are the tips that we need. Uh, the last thing, sorry, about the blood glucose. A patient, you know, sugar is less than three, and he's showing symptoms with that. He's, you know, two. If he has no symptoms with this, you know, sugar, he is three. The sugar is more than 18. With signs of dehydration, he is two. With no signs with the sugar more than 18, he's a these are some of the tips that may help you a lot, you know, when it comes to triaging patient, you know, dehydration, we spoke about this. Any question about the modifiers and the tips and uh, for the pediatric patients?
Uh, if no question, we'll give you. So first order modifiers, we spoke about the vital signs, leading disorder, pain assessment, and mechanism of injury. Those all your vitals uh, should be done for every single patient. Now, if your patient has no, you know, trauma, no fall, no motor vehicle accident, we cannot apply, you know, mechanism of injury. If your patient is not taking, you know, anticoagulant or not, you know, uh, have acquired you know, uh, or congenital and, uh, bleeding disorder, we cannot apply. You apply the first modifiers based on the patient representation. So I'll give you five minutes. Now, possibility of having this presentation, we'll speak to the uh, moderator. They, they can answer you these questions. Let's prepare for the second you know, lecture. Give you five minutes, stretch, and stay tuned, please. to the last part of our you know, session now, which is about uh, sepsis. And we'll share you the most updated you know, guidelines about pediatric sepsis in emergency. Uh, do you hear me very well? OK, good. So let's start, OK? So this is the surviving sepsis campaign that was done in 2018, and they published their you know, guidelines in 2019. And uh, as all of you know, sepsis is uh, le the leading cause of morbidity, mortality, and healthcare utilization in children worldwide. And it can be get, uh, get missed easily in emergency, uh, especially if you have uh, a huge volume of pediatric patients come to emergency. So globally or worldwide, you know, we're talking about estimated 22 cases of childhood sepsis per, you know, uh, 100,000 cases per year. And we're talking about uh, roughly about 2,200 cases neonatal sepsis uh, per, you know, 100,000 uh, per okay. So we have a huge number of you know, a neonatal sepsis. The majority of children who die from sepsis from refractory shock or multiple organ dysfunction syndrome with many diseases occurring within the initial 48 to 72 hours. Guys, can you see the screen?
Is it clear like this? Can you see the screen? Why? Okay, excellent. So sorry. So uh, just continue. Now we need to focus on very important point. Okay, that many deaths occurring within the initial 48 to 72 hours of treatment, and this is you know if we are you know doing early identification and appropriate station and management to, to those patients, we have critical optimizing good outcomes. So we should be focusing in the in the triage because the triage is the door and the window. If we able to identify those patients early, okay, we will be able to stop the septic process in their bodies. And, and this is all depends on we have, you know, an, an strong, a CTAS and strong nurses who can apply the principles, the modifiers to, you know, able to sort out, identify, recognize those patients and start the treatment as soon as possible. And all of you know that these microorganisms, these bacteria, they multiply, you know, exponentially very quickly. So in order to stop this sepsis process, we need to start the earliest, you know, the, the, and the sooner is the better outcome for those patients. So though in, that, in that meeting, okay, they, there are, you know, 49 international experts in representing 12 international organizations. They have a panel meeting and they met in the air, the, in the air in the late 2019. What was their, you know, objectives? To develop evidence-based recommendation for clinician caring for children, including infants, school age children, and adolescents with septic shock and other sepsis associated with organ dysfunction. So they discuss, you know, recognition of the sepsis, management of infection, Hydrodynamics and resuscitations, ventilation, endocrine, metabolic therapies, okay, and adjunct therapy and research priorities for the futures. So, out of this panel meeting, there was 77 statements, you know, came out about management of resuscitation of children with sepsis and septic shock and overall there was there were six were strong recommendations and 52 were a weak recommendation and nine were best practice statements the conclusion is a large cohort of international experts was able to achieve consensus regarding many recommendations for the best care of children with sepsis, acknowledging that the most aspect of care had relatively low quality evidence resulting the frequent issuance of weak recommendations. So they try to eliminate the weak recommendation from the practice. And they have changed some, you know, definition about the septic and sepsis itself. So in the old, it used to be like, you know, defining sepsis as a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection and septic shock is a subset of sepsis with circulatory and cellular metabolic disorder dysfunction. The new definition defines sepsis as septic shock in children as a severe infection to leading cardiovascular dysfunction, including hypotension, need for treatment with vasoactive medication or impaired perfusion. And sepsis associated with organ dysfunction in children as a severe infection leading to cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular organ dysfunction. So there, there was a change in the definition of sepsis and septic shock. And the panel intended these guidelines to apply to all patients from greater than 30 weeks of gestation to uh, 18 years old, uh, applying the severe sepsis and septic shock that divide by 2005. 
and screening. As all of you, we have different tools screening patients who uh, presenting to emergency with sepsis. How do we, what system you use that's based in your institution and your hospital or your facility? In children who present as acutely unwell, we suggest implementing systemic screening for timely recognition of septics or shock, other sepsis associated with organ, organ dysfunction. This was a weak recommendation, a very low quality of evidence. However, many hospitals, they use different systems, you know, to uh, do a screening, you know, for the patients who comes with the, to emergency to see if they are having a sepsis alert or SARS alert, and in this way, they can catch them earlier and start the treatment as soon as possible. Although optimal method of tool is unclear, so there are different methods or tools uh, that can be used, but they suggest screening can be adapted to the type of patient resources and processes with each institution. Again, so if you do, if you are caring of a healthy, you know, uh, if you have a primary care or emergency that, you know, see healthy kids, okay, they don't have, you know, uh, immunosuppression, they don't, they don't use uh, medication that suppresses their immunity, they are not transplanted. They are not oncological patients. You should have. You should adapt. You know, a you know a protocol or screening tool that will benefit. You know, this type or group of people. While if you have, you know, a very sick, very tertiary hospital, your tool should be. You know, a complicated and can you know catch all those. You know, neutropenic or uh, immunocompromised patients. So this is you know differ from institution to institution. Now, systematic screening needs to be tailored, as we said, to the type of patient, resources, procedure that the hospital run. And this is, you know, uh, should be incorporated as a part of this process, should be part of your process when you're assessing the patient and in, in the system integrated. Now, why we need a systemic screening for sepsis in children is you know, the early recognition again to will be having the better outcome, start the treatment earlier, and will, will decrease the mortality out for those patients. What are the tests need to be uh, taken in case of uh, for those patients? Uh, lactate levels provide valuable indirect marker or tissue hypoperfusion, although increased lactate are not specific. They are provide quant uh, quantifiable you know, surrogate for tissue hypoxia and can be rapidly obtained by point of care testing if you do have one in your hospital. This is a study done in PICU. Uh, the mortality rate in children with hypotension required vasopressor with lactate greater than two millimole per liter was 32% compared with a 16% with lactate is less than two or equal to two millimoles. The final word is lactate level should be therefore interpreted as a part of more comprehensive assessment of clinical status and perfusion. So it should not be taken as a solo, you know, lab to say this patient is septic and we need to start or not to start vasopressor for those patients. So it should be part of the whole picture when we're treating uh, or investigating patients. Most of these studies have focused on timely delivery bundles therapy. And we're talking about the bundles, we're talking about three, three things, blood culture, fluid bolus, and antibiotic. And they recommended, you know, initiating antimicrobial therapy in situation where this does not substantially delay the antimicrobial administration. So they recommend the blood culture to be taken before the antibiotic. However, in some institution, if this is may delay, you know, the anti anti antibiotic, we should, you know, substantially, you know, give the antibiotic. Other blood cultures, we're talking about uh, CSF, urine, 
tracheal aspirate, bronchial uh, alveolar level drainage, okay, should be happened as soon as possible, okay. And this is depending on the suspected site of infection. The most important thing is to remember we recommend starting antimicrobial therapy within one hour of recognition. So the door is one hour. Once you recognize those patient is having, uh, you know, sepsis, we should start, you know, uh, the, this is a strong recommendation, but it, it is a very quality of evidence. They don't have enough evidence to prove it, but this was a strong recommendation from the panel. They recommend to use empiric broad spectrum uh, therapy with one or more antimicrobial to cover all likely pathogens. Once the pathogens and sensitivity comes from microbiology, they can narrow in their empiric antimicrobial therapy. But the first, they will start with the empiric you know, broad spectrum, one or more. In children with sepsis associated with you know, organ dysfunction, but without shock, we suggest, you know, starting, you know, antimicrobial therapy as soon as possible after appropriate evaluation, within three hours. So as we said, you know, if we have a septic shock, the door is one hour. If they have uh, sepsis that associated with organ, organ dysfunction, but no shock, there's no hypotension, okay, the recommendation is it with the three hours. However, this was a weak recommendation and with a very low uh, quality of evidence. Now, the empiric antimicrobial therapy, the empiric antimicrobial therapy uh, should start in for suspected infection in absence of a definitive microbiology pathogene identification. So if the healthcare provider, the pediatric emergency has no uh, uh, has not to identify the microbiology, uh, microbiological pathogen, they will start, you know, with empiric antibiotic. Antimicrobial as broad spectrum with activity against multiple different groups, they will use the broad spectrum bacteria and other pathogen to be likely cause the clinical presentation. How to start? The initial choice of empiric antimicrobial should be taken into account in a clinical history, the age of the patient, site of infection, recent uh, if patient having any, you know, uh, devices, comorbidities, morbidities. Patient with the recent current hospital exposure should be received empiric therapy that considers non-infection or colonization as well as the recent antimicrobial exposure. If he has been admitted to the hospital and known to have this infection before, they should have, you know, get the empiric therapy uh, as they expected. This is the cause of the pathogen of the infection. Immunocompromised patient, uh, antimicrobial therapy should be begin with anti pseudomonal third or higher generation cephalosporin, cefepim, or broad spectrum carbavidin and moropenem or imembenem. Those uh, for an immunocompromised. Healthy child, they can start, you know, third generation cephalosporine like cefalosporine and may be sufficient. Vancomycin should be only added if they have uh, MRSA or cefalosporine resistance. In addition, if an aminoglycoside or substitution of uh, carbamaminin is appropriate in setting where subtraxone is resistant, it's a common gram-negative gram bacteria once, you know, the culture is back and the sensitivity is back. For neonates, therapy should include ampicillin for listeria and concentration of empiric acyclovir if there's any clinical concern of herpes zoster virus. Now, the fluid, as we all you know, we have uh, uh, given, we can give three policies, but these three policies should be, you know, in 10 to 20 ml per kg per polis to reach up to 40 to 60 ml per kg uh, as a total. And this is 
each was given uh, over first hour. Titrated to clinical markers, cardiac output, and if there's any signs of overload. And this was a weak recommendation, low quality of evidence. Now, if there is no, no availability of intensive care unit and the absence of hypotension, your patient is not in shock. The recommendation was to start, you know, uh, against bolus fluid and administration of maintenance fluid, you know, uh, instead of, and this was a strong recommendation. So if you have no ICU monitoring for your patients in your emergency and your patient not in shock, they recommend to start a maintenance of fluid, not a bolus fluid. If a hypotension is present, as we said, we suggest administering, you know, a bolus 10 to 20 ml per kg per bolus over the first hour. And this was a weak recommendation. So they suggested to use a balanced buffer crystalloids rather than the saline for the initial station of your children with septic shock. And they prefer to use, you know, more ringer lactate, and that was a weak recommendation. Hemodynamics, they, they were unable to issue a recommendation about target mean arterial pressure map at the fifth or the 50th percentile for the age with the septic shock. Uh, however, in our practice, we targeting always the mean arterial pressure to be between the fifth and the 50th percentile uh, or greater. Uh, for the age. So for every certain age, you have a, a normal mean arterial pressure. So whether we're targeting, you know, the 50th percentile or greater uh, when we are looking for their, uh, you know, arterial uh, monitoring pressure or when we start them in inotropic support. When it comes to the uh, medication, they suggest using epinephrine rather than dopamine in children with septic shock. That was a weak recommendation. They suggest using norepinephrine rather than dopamine. Also, that was a weak recommendation. They were unable to issue a recommendation for the specific first line vasoactive infusion in children with septic shock. However, the practice that you know, either selected epinephrine or norepinephrine as a first line vasoactive infusion guided by the clinician preference, individual patient physiology and local system factors. And, you know, if your patient having a cold, you know, uh, septic shock, usually the, the start, the, uh, the choice is epinephrine. If a patient have uh, a warm one, the, the, the best choice is norepinephrine. These are, you know, their recommendation and for the uh, sepsis campaign and how it is the bundles, the one hour, the three hours, the phase of reserve and the lab that needed to be drawn. Do you have any questions? Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Hassan. Hassan, for this uh, interesting overview of sepsis. And if anybody has any question, please. Or we can go for uh, Asr prayer and uh, we'll close by now. And tomorrow we will start from 8 o'clock, please.